tai e he akiana ta atakura e tio he huka he hohu ti he moriora. A very big warm welcome today to um, my colleagues, uh, all the councillors, and of course our wonderful public participants. Thank you so much for giving up your valuable time today. I appreciate in a COVID time um, appearing online is, is quite tricky, so thank you so much. Um, so colleagues, if you could just uh, let Ms Mueller know if you intend to leave the meeting. Um, lunch will be at 11.50 and there's going to be 15 minute breaks between each um, of our four sessions. Um, I'm now just going to move uh, apologies from Councillor Young for being late for 15 minutes and uh, the Mayor as well. Are there any other apologies? No, all right, could I have a seconder for that? Thank you, Councillor Paul. Um, if you could now vote, please. Thank you. Uh, just waiting on votes from Councillor Rush. Thank you. Uh, that is 11 in favour, which is everyone that we have at the moment. Unanimous. Great, thank you. Uh, conflict of interest declarations, has anyone got anything to declare? No, thank you. Um, and I'm now just going to move the um, the minutes from uh, Pororo Amoa um, from the 24th of November. Uh, can I have a seconder? Councillor Paul, potentially, thank you. Um, can we now vote? Thank you. Uh, that is 11 in favour. Liz has just joined, but she's still connecting to audio, so she may not be able to vote for this one, but that has carried. Kia ora. All right, there are no items not on the agenda, um, and obviously you've got a list of the public participants today. Um, now, I do need to um, suspend some standing orders to allow this forum to take place. So that's 16.1, uh, the mode of address, 16.4, chairperson rising, 16.5 members to speak in place and address the chairperson, 16.6 priority of speakers, rules of debate the entire section 20.1 to 20.14 and points of order the entire section 26.1 to 26.7 and then um, I will move that we will agree to reinstate all the standing orders at 3.30 when the meeting resumes in the plenary. So that is done. Um, so uh, we are now just going to. Um, sorry, Councillor, that just oh, is a vote. So we need is, to it is a vote, just a vote on that one. Yes, please. We do have to vote. Sorry, it didn't say my notes. I thought I could just do it. Right, if you could just vote, please. Sorry. Thank you. And someone to second, please. Oh, sorry, Councillor Paul. Well, thank you. Just waiting on a vote from Councillor Calvert. This is on suspension of standing orders, Councillor Calvert. Uh, yes, so that's to allow this to be conducted by a forum, is it? That's, that's correct. correct, yes. Right. Uh, so there is 12 votes in favour, one against with Councillor Calvert. Thank you. Right, so um, you are now to go into your um, separate Zoom rooms. Um, Councillor Paul and Deputy Mayor Free have uh, kindly agreed to facilitate two of the sessions I'll be facilitating the third. Um, so if you could go into those rooms now, um, and we very much look forward to hearing what you've got to say. And I'll see councillors back at 3.30. Kia ora. So I own it. Do we just leave this and click on the other link? Yes, that's correct, Liz. Thank you. So get out of this one and click on the other. Yeah, one. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Has it been emailed to us? Is it? Yeah. Yes. The bottom. It has been. Okay. Are we supposed to do something too? Iona, Kilda, Tato. Right, uh, and Alan, you're in the right room. Oh, okay. Good. Okay. Right, see you later. Right, sorry, and I'm just opening up another. Oh, I'm just finding my email. Sorry, no, no, no. It is all quite um complicated. 
Right, so we've got uh, councillors Wolf, Condi, O'Neill. I can't find the link. All right. Well, oh, is it on the run sheet? Um, I'm just going to put them in the chat. So if you copy them into your browser, won't be a sec. The run sheet link. Yay. <laughs> You should see those in the Zoom chat now. Oh, I am in the right group. <laughs> yeah, you are. Councillor Rush is not in the right group. To Purely right. by luck. All right. Okay. Well, look. Um. Again, a warm welcome to our public participants. Thank you so much for uh, giving up your time. Um. It is a busy time of year already. So, if I could just ask people to um introduce themselves, uh, go in a, a round, um, and then we'll get into hearing what you've got to say. So maybe I'll just start just to break the ice. Um, uh, kia ora koutou, um, koutou. I'm Iona Panet, the chair of Furoro Amoa. Uh, Councillor Wolf, do you want to go next? Yeah, hi there. Um, Simon Wolf. But, um, I'm a councillor for the Whārangi Onslow Western Ward. Do you want to just flick on to someone else on the screen? You can just appoint them. I can appoint them. I'll go, yeah. go Terry. Okay. Um, kia ora, I'm Councillor Terry O'Neill. I represent Tumutu Kairangi, the eastern suburbs, and I will tag Joey. Hi, I'm Joey, I'm fellow participant. Um, I live in Mount Victoria with the Ministry of Education, but not representing that. Um, I'm Ellen. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, I'm Ellen Blake with Living Streets Aotearoa Pedestrian Advocacy Group. And I tag Jenny, I think. Next. Kia ora, I'm Councillor Jenny Condi. I represent Takapu Northern Ward, which is Johnson Malata Tower. Sorry, you're on mute. You tag who? Judith. Uh, yeah, Hi, everybody. I'm Judith Gray. I'm a business owner in Johnsonville of uh, Nada Bakery and I'm here accompanying um, one of my staff who put the submission in originally. So, so I'm Renee Pierce. I am the assistant manager of our Johnsonville branch of Nada Bakery and I am the one who originally put forward the submission. We tag Jill Day. Oh, Jill's not on this group. No, um, she was. <laughs> okay. Oh, Cecile, do you want to introduce yourself? Yep. Okay. Um, apologies, I'm on the phone because this I sort of last minute forgot my tablet, so <laughs> you'll see my hand on my screen for a lot. Um, yeah, I'm Cecile from Tawa. Um, stay at home mom. So and yeah, and biking. <laughs> So yeah, it's me. I don't. I, it's hard for me to see who else is in here. So okay. Um, um what about Colin Fraser? Hello, are you hearing me? Yes. Yeah, I'm trying to get the video going, but um, I'm just an interested individual um, living in the Kilburnie area, Kilburnie Lyle Bay area. Great. Thank you. Welcome, John. Uh, kia ora, um, John Beaglehole. I'm a long-time cyclist, live in Karori. Um, really interested to, to be part of this process and uh, see, see what we can do to keep cycling moving in Wellington. And then, sorry, we've got staff, or Tony R. Councillor Fitzsimons. Well, Councillor Fitzsimons, too. <laughs> sorry. Um, Everybody, Fleur Fitzsimon, City Councillor for the Paikawakawa Southern Ward. I look forward to hearing from you. And we have a Tony R. Is that Tony Randall? Sorry, Chi, I'm just. Oh, yeah. thank you. Tony, how are you? Hello, yeah, Tony Randall from uh, Johnsonville. I'm just uh, interested as well in the, in the bike plan and, and, and uh, yeah, thought I'd just listen in. Thanks. Great. And would the staff like to introduce themselves now too? Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Joe Hewitt. I'm uh, one of the advisors for the Bike Network Plan. Hello, everybody. I'm Heidi Mueller, and I'm a senior democracy advisor. You would have received many emails from me. 
Kia ora, um, I'm Emily, I'm a democracy advisor. Um, I'm just learning, so I'm yeah joining this meeting as well. Kia ora. Wonderful everyone, thank you. Okay, so basically the way we run this is to give um, everyone five minutes to speak uninterrupted. Um, so we'll just listen to everyone and then there'll be some time for discussion. Um, is there anyone that would like to go first? Quite relaxed. Oh, Ellen. And then Joey, maybe? Kia ora. Oh, great. Um, so, kia ora tato. I'm Ellen Blake with Living Streets Pedestrian Advocacy. So, um, we are very interested in the bike network plan. Um, we think that more walking is good for everyone. We think that more biking is good for everyone. And we think that more um, bus and train use is good for everyone. So, this plan is um, part of the way to helping um, better biking and uh, overall better for everybody. Um, so it's an opportunity to achieve that. So what we want to make sure is that while it's doing better biking, it's also improving or not making worse um, walking and bus transport. Um, so, and that's entirely achievable. Um, one of the things that we think this plan should also address is fixing some of the existing bike uh, paths that have taken or using shared paths, because as we know from reading all the guidance, shared paths that do, don't work. So we've got a whole list of those in our submission. We're quite keen to make sure that um, where there are bike paths next to footpaths that um, we keep a really good footpath surface so that won't be concrete because it's too hard and unforgiving for pedestrians. And we want to make sure that um, footpaths keep a really great level of service for pedestrians so there's no parking of bikes or other vehicle accessories on them. Um, we are very keen to make sure that this bike network plan has a, a bike, a proper separated, really good um, cycleway along the quays and through Cable and Wakefield Street. That seems to be a bigger mission in the bike plan so far. And we want to make sure that the um, interface between pedestrians is uh, on the footpath and when they're getting on and off the bus uh, works really well. So no, no bike um, paths between footpaths and bus access would be really a great step forward. So those are all things that are entirely achievable within this bike network plan, which we overall support. And that's my tuppence. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was incredibly clear. Right, Joey, welcome. Joey and I used to work together. So nice to see you, Joey. Do likewise. How are you? Great, great. Cool. I'm really just talking about, um, as an individual. Um, I went and live in Mount Victoria. Um, I don't, have, don't own a car, I just cycle around the city normally. Um, my daily route takes me down Marjorie Banks Street, Marge Banks. Um, but you can get, trying to get from there to the waterfront is a fairly perilous mission. Joining Kent Terrace, um, three lane road, another lane merging into you. Um, very perilous. So, occasion, so occasionally, probably what Alan Blake's talking about, um, they are forced to use the footpath to get to the waterfront, which is really not ideal. Um, but alas, probably saves my life. Um, I'm thinking about the Marjorie Banks, it's quite a main thoroughfare. I see it's not no plans um, on the network plan. Um, I know a lot of mountain bikers connect from Mount Vic and zoom down the road and vice versa. A lot of people heading up the road, squeezed in between parked cars, buses, people zooming around into Hawker Street. It's just quite a, it's quite a perilous street and quite busy. Um, perhaps could do some consideration. Um, think also thinking about the new town to Island Bay kind of links. Um, not entirely sure what's planned for along there, but again, narrow roads, busy, a lot of just quite, it's quite a perilous mission. I cycle out to my friend's house in Island Bay, and it's just unpleasant. Um, I'm happy to see the Miramar Peninsula bike network planned. Um, I think that's a really nice. It's just a pleasant bike ride, fun for you know, exercise, recreation. I'm sure people will use it to live there as well. Um, yeah, just happy to see that. Um, I was also just thinking about shared paths that um, like Ellen brought up. Um, I lived in Japan before. They managed to do shared paths pretty well. Um, Hokkaido, um, Sasaporo City I'm thinking about that have dotted lines along the path seem to work really well. Um, certainly not ideal, but it worked. 
that's pretty much my bit. Thanks. Wonderful, very clear too. Who'd like to go next? I'll make a, <coughs> make a short comment. Um, right in five minutes. I, I would just support um, Aileen's comments vehemently. <laughs> and the fact that I'm not going to say much doesn't um, indicate the strength which I support that. It's been well thought out, Aileen, and I compliment you on what you've done there. Um, I would just say that, yes, um, cycleways are definitely feasible. They're good in terms of in reducing carbon emissions, promoting personal health. Um, and I strongly believe, my father was in business, and I'm in business myself, but not in a retail business, that it is quite feasible to um, um, have a situation in which retail businesses are not unduly compromised by their existence. It may need some work. I do have a, acknowledge that there are some streets in Wellington which simply would not be suited having bikes on the too narrow, they're too windy. I, I find it very hard to envisage how bikes could get down them um, uh, without putting themselves in considerable danger. Nonetheless, link routes would be important even if they're a bit longer. The final comment is, put, <laughs> I'll put it bluntly, I would have thought footpaths are for feet. And I would don't believe that, that any person older than say school age of the order of five years should be using them for scooters. It, I'm not driving anymore, I stopped about three years ago because of eyesight issues. And I am constantly concerned about these wheeled vehicles that are now on footpaths. And do you think we should be doing it without much to get, get rid of them, <laughs> put them somewhere else? Cheers. Thank you. Again, so clear and succinct. Thank you. Right. Uh, who would like to go next? John, Judith, Renee? Uh, yep, well, I'll go. Um, I am speaking on behalf of Nata Bakery as well as somewhat of an individual. Um, first of all, I'm not against putting the cycle lanes in, more so just along the main road of Johnsonville. If you are aware with the current situation with the amount of peak hour traffic and the roundabouts, um, the roundabout just coming out of Moorfield Road is probably our busiest roundabout in Johnsonville. Um, so far, we've had a colleague that works alongside of us who has actually been hit on that crossing, um, walking as a pedestrian along the zebra crossing. Um, so the thought of having a cycle lane going through that main roundabout in Johnsonville is quite horrifying, sort of just thinking of the cyclist's safety, first of all. Um, also, the potential risk it could do to local businesses. Um, we have around three retirement villages in the Johnsonville area, so a lot of our local customers are elderly customers. So taking away that footpath access and the on-road access would be quite a downfall for them. It's easy access to the banks, the laundry mat, even just local dairies and food markets. So instead of really putting it straight through the main road of Johnsonville, um, we have done research looking back to the 2014 plan where the original cycle lane was going through Moorfield Road and down through Onslow Road, which I personally feel would be a safer option for cyclists. So yeah, Judith, do you have anything else to add? Um, hi everybody. Yes, I, I think that the Moorfield Road option, <clears throat> first of all, it was the original option in the, in the 2014 um, plans for the area, as Renee mentioned. Um, Moorfield Road allows better access to local schools rather than the main road of Johnsonville, um, access to the library, uh, the transport hub, uh, doctors, um, surgeries and so forth. Uh, so it seems like the most sensible uh, part to put 
a cycleway without disrupting the traffic flow of the main road of Johnsonville. I also echo uh, Renee's points about the roundabout at the northern end of Johnsonville Road. It is a dangerous roundabout to enter whether you're on a, in a car or any other mode of transport. Uh, and <clears throat> I feel that, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, cyclists entering there from Johnsonville Road have no form of protection. Um, and at least if they come from Moorfield Road, they've got footpaths and uh, side roads where they can stop and um, assess the traffic before they enter that roundabout. Um, Johnsonville Road, they just take their life in their hands. So if the council um, has the power to change the current plans to put cycleways along Moorfield Road, I think that has so many more advantages for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, that was really helpful. Right, Cecile or John? Um, I'm very happy to go next. Um, look, and I should talk a wee bit about, about myself. Um, I, I've been cycling in Wellington since I think 1981, which is a wee, a wee while now. I used to cycle down to Wellington College from Karori, um, and the traffic was bad then, and it's got a wee bit better since. I think people have got more used to, uh, to cycle bikes on the road, which is good. Um, I've got two children who I can no longer describe as young, but they're certainly at an age where they still need a bit of running around. Um, so I, I cycle, but I do also drive and you know I use my car for um, groceries and things like that. So I'm conscious that there, there are two sides to this coin. Um, look, having said that, I think there'd be five main points that I would make. The first is I would, um, I would uh, there's a verb here which I can't get, get hold of, but I would encourage the council to get a move on with this. Yeah, there's been a whole lot of consultation about cycling and in and around Wellington. I think the time has come to start building and to build quickly. I've been um, amazed to see what Paris has done in a very short space of time. They've put a huge number of cycle lanes in. Um, and the council did some very good work on Brooklyn Hill, putting the interim solution in on the uphill. It'd be interesting to see if there are other opportunities to use interim solutions to get some bike lanes in and then tweak them. If they're not working, if they need a bit of adjustment, tweak them. But let's actually get some stuff in place. The second is, I think that traffic separation is really important. Um, painted lines on a road are something, but a painted line on a road doesn't stop um, a tonne and a half of metal hitting you at an intersection. Um, so it's safer, and that's the sort of thing that will increase the number of cyclists, um, and you'll start to see, I think, a, a greater return on your investment than you otherwise might get. Equally, things like more 30 kilometre an hour zones and more traffic calming measures and more low traffic neighbourhoods will also make people feel much more confident about cycling and you'll get more people cycling. Okay. If, if on the way, you know, if I ride down from Karori straight down to work, I ride down uh, by the Botanic Gardens. Um, it's a nightmare. There's a whole lot of traffic. There's buses, there's traffic going two ways. You either sit in the traffic going extremely slowly, or if you try and skirt around the edges, um, it's not an very it's not a very enjoyable experience, and it's not a particularly safe one either. But if you want to encourage cycling, if you want to feel make cyclists feel that they're part of the flow, then reducing the speed of traffic um, will do that. I think equally and this is picking up on some points that other people have made, designing and bus priority is really important. If you're going to be messing around with the streets, why not design and bus priority lanes at the same time? Now, I realise that this is a big ask, but I would have thought there would be significant advantages from doing messing with the streets once rather than twice. And again, if you want to move people out of cars and into buses and towards more forms of active transport, then making sure that buses can get through traffic and do so quickly, that's something that will make a difference to bus use. I would put in a small plug for reducing bus fares as well, but then I realise that might be slightly outside this, the ambit of this meeting. Um, I would also um, reinforce the point that people have made about pedestrian separation. Um, 
you know, if I am cycling along doing almost 30 kilometers an hour and I hit a five-year-old, I have never done that, I'm very glad to say, but it's not going to be that great for a five-year-old. It's not that great for me. You know, you really need to, when there really needs to be a way of um, getting bikes away from footpaths. And I, you know, I'd reinforce the point that I thought Ellen made very well early on. We, having separation allows pedestrians to feel safer. It allows cyclists to feel safer. Um, it's, I think it really is much better for everyone. I also, um, I'd like to pick up on the points Renee was making, though, though to generalise out of those a wee bit. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not that familiar with Johnsonville. Um, I'm reasonably familiar with Karori. Um, yeah, at the moment, the, the proposal for the, for the bike lane runs all the way through the main road. Um, and that is, it's not called the main road for nothing. Um, it's the main link into Karori. It's chocker with traffic. Um, and it's, it's um, I do think that there would be, it would be better to take the bike lane off to one side. Um, you could have much more space for bicycles. You wouldn't interfere with parking. You would allow people who do need to use their cars for one reason or another to get to the shops that, that are located on the, on the road front and you know, there's no other realistic parking for them. Um, and for particularly for elderly customers, I, I, you know, I do have some sympathy with what Renee um, was saying earlier. That's important. That's the way that they, they move around at the moment. Um, so yeah, look, I'm, I'm very much in favor. I would encourage the council to move and to move quickly and um, look forward, I'm looking forward to the discussion next. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And Cecile, lastly. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah. Um, I won't be as organized as everybody else. Sorry. Um, anyway, so I'm my and my points will be pretty much about what I've experienced. So I can't speak to a lot of what, um, like the more of the other parts of the plan. It's just what I've experienced biking around Tawa. So I only started biking. Um, I mean, after you know doing it as a kid and you know uh, occasionally in my in as an adult um I started biking regularly last year when my kids started school so I, I bought a uh, cargo bike to bring her to and from school and then also to do groceries etc you know after between those um and, and 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 actually one of the main reasons why we decided to do that was uh, we live near a shared pathway which uh, meant I felt safe enough to have my kid in the back with me um, without being too afraid of getting hit by a car. Um, except, you know, I still, I'm actually, I actually do go pretty slowly um, um, while I'm biking um, because I'm afraid of cars coming out of driveways, that sort of thing on the shared pathways. Um, but actually once, um, once I reach, so I use a shared pathway up to a certain point, but because the schools are along main road, I actually do end up on the footpath because I don't like sharing the road with the cars and I don't go anywhere near fast enough that I don't, I, I'm pretty sure I will not, uh, you know, I, I, I'm scared. Well, I get nervous around, uh, I used to get nervous around 15 Ks and now I'm nervous around 20. I'm terrified at 30. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'd stay on the footpath and you know, I, I I slow down and let pedestrians go first because I know that I'm not supposed to be there. But um, yeah, um, and the main road is chocker full, full of cars. Um, yeah, there's no way of going on. I tried it during lockdown, to be honest, and I was just it was a scary thing for me still going on main road on a bike with my kid in the back. So. Um, yeah, um, I guess my but the other thing is um, I think I think the um, having a cycleway along Middleton Road might have been on the plan. I can't remember now, but um, that would be nice because that's one of the things that's stopping me from going to Johnsonville. As it is, I go to Porua more often because the pathway goes all the way there. Um, although um, I don't know how you're going to put a cycleway on Middleton Road because even in a bus, I, I'm terrified. <laughs> while I'm riding the bus, the bus going through Middleton because it feels like a very narrow road 
So, yeah. Um, but I do know other cyclists do that regularly. So, um, yeah, I guess my, that's my main thing is that, you know, the shared pathway is great until you actually need to go to shops or, or anything else that are located on the main road. So just, I guess, something to think about. And yeah, so I end up being on the footpath because I can't, I'm, um, unlike people that um, have been cycling for a while or, or, you know, more, you know, I wouldn't say aggressive, but certainly more confident. I yes, actually, that's the proper adjective is uh, more confident um, cyclists. I I do feel I have to stay on the footpath because I can't. Yeah, I just can't um, handle <laughs> the traffic. Okay, I think that's that's it for me. <gasps> Thank you very much for sharing your experience. It's really helpful. Um, uh, look, Tony and Ian, um, if it's okay, I'd just like to. Um, Maybe if we can talk later at, at your appointed session, just to give the other submitters the maximum amount of time to uh, share further views. I hope that's okay. Um, Councillors, maybe just to break the ice, is there? Is, does anyone want to ask a question of the submitters, and then hopefully we can get some discussion going. That would be um, great. Of any, you know, anything you want to clarify or understand. And I see some hands up. Thank you, uh, Councillor O'Neill, Councillor Wolf, and Councillor Fitzsimon. Thank you. Um, thank you for everybody sharing your experience. My partai, my question is for Joey. Um, you mentioned that Japan does shared paths well. Could you talk a little bit about what that looks like? How how separated? Um, you know, is there a slow lane and a fast lane, or or how does that shared path work? Sure. Well, I mean, so I was there in 2014. Um, so they didn't take into account electric bikes, electric scooters zooming along. It's more kind of like, I don't know, kids getting to school, doddering along. So they had, they just had footpaths, but it's not, they had painted lines. It was kind of like, you know, walk on the left, cycle on the right kind of thing. Um, oh, wow. I think it's, yeah. I think it definitely comes, there's like a, it's a different culture there. Like it's not about zooming along. It's just a myth. It's like a, I don't know, kind of like an alternate myth of transport, I think, because, like Wellingtonians are so used to cycling amongst traffic, we get into our heads like we're one of these cars, we have to zoom along and it becomes quite aggressive. I think it's just different there because they do, you know, if, it's, if it's not, if there's not a cycle lane, it's a shared path. Um, yes, yeah, so I just found it kind of quite easy. Just, you know, you go slowly along the path around them. Usually they're in between like linked cycleways, um, just in particular spots. Yeah, I definitely know it's not, I don't think it's the best thing ever, but it was better than being in traffic. How wide would you say, like how much space, for example, like the Evans Bay um, has kind of like a shared, sorry, not Evans Bay, around Wellington Waterfront and Oriental Bay. How, mm. Is it uh, wider than that or slimmer or does it take up a whole lane of road? Sorry, everyone, last part. Um, they could be, you know, they'd, they'd vary a lot. Um, I'm thinking about they had, they'd, often there'd be like you know trees that would appear in the way of the path, so you just you'd stop. But it was kind of give way to a pedestrian type situation. Um, yeah, it, it varied a lot to be honest. Great, thanks. Can I make a little comment on that? Um, sure. I'm, inter I'm interested that you brought up the Japanese experience. The Japanese um, are trying to get um, cyclists off footpaths now because there's a, a huge increase in um, crashes, and I think they've had some deaths there as well. In 1978, they introduced this idea that you could um, bike on footpaths, um, and it, when there's low numbers, it was um, apparently worked sort of okay but um it's not working very well now people do not like shared paths as pedestrians pedestrians walk a fast person walks at five kilometers now that's people like me who are fit and able not children not older people not people with disabilities what you don't see with shared paths is the people who don't go out walking because they are too frightened people are frightened to get hit by e-scooters also obviously now but um and our guidance in New Zealand is very clear that shared paths are not best practice. They are not best practice. They're not good for cyclists and they're not good for pedestrians. So just, you know, yeah. Fair enough. All right. Um, now, Simon and then Fleur. Yes. Thanks, Chair. Um, this is for John. And um, thank, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, 
yeah, it was very pragmatic and and I learned a lot from it. Um, just to clarify, you like trials. Is that that's the first question? And secondly, um, Councillor Calvert and I have tried to implement trials in, in Karoo without any success on the main road because we got um, pushback from side streets. Just wondering what, what your vision would be for um, off Karori Road. Sure. Um, I, I think what I would say in, in relation to the first question is that I like trials if they're a way of getting some stuff done quickly. I would much rather move to a permanent solution, but if that's not possible, then let's not, you know, muck around. Let's not the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, in terms of an alternative to Karori Main Road, I think there's one obvious alternative on the west side, which is the sort of Homewood Avenue, Friend Street. Um, there's that little link road that then runs through um, just off, off on, at the end of Park, of Friend Street on the other side of Park Bell Road, all the way down um, to Karori Park. Uh, so I think there's a, a natural bike path there. Um, and most of those roads are pretty wide and could easily get a bike lane in there. Or if they were reduced to 30 kilometre an hour zones, that would be a very good start. Um, on the other side of the main road, on the Karori Normal School side, it's a bit harder to see. The, the line is not quite as clear, but I think there would certainly be advantages in having something along Braithwaite Street um, and Birdwood Avenue coming down the hill. Now that's, I, um, I don't bike down there very much at the moment, but when I walk down there in the mornings, there's a lot of cyclists who ride on the footpath because riding on the road, it's very narrow, um, two-way traffic, it's pretty unsafe. Um, and for the reasons that, that Ellen just mentioned, I think, I think separating cyclists and pedestrians is really the best way to go. I think that um, I think it's unsafe for pedestrians, um, and I, I agree with her. It's also not that great for cyclists. Well, thank you. Thank you, Fleur. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I'm having a few IT problems, but I'm I'm listening in. Um, I guess my question is to the submitters here today. Um, Around the extent to which you think residents and the community understand that building more bike lanes is about reducing emissions in, in the, this current context and whether that's kind of well understood in the community or whether you think the council's probably got a bit more work to do um, in making sure that residents understand that's the thinking behind the proposals. So quite a big question. Does anyone want to have a go at the submitters that hasn't spoken maybe? Already? I don't know, Judith and um, Renee just uh, out in Johnsonville. Do you want to have a go at that? Don't have to, just. I might, I'll, I guess I'll talk to it for a little bit. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, uh, I guess I, I, I personally see, yes, okay, it's a way to roll over emissions, but I think, I guess my impression, uh, at least on the social media, is that most people, even though theoretically they might want to lower emissions, that they don't want it to impact their current lifestyle, if that makes sense, you know? Um, so, um, yeah, change will be hard. So, I, yeah, I think that's, <laughs> that's going to be. That's, that's my impression, at least. Thank you. Anyone else want to have a go at answering that? I will. Um, I don't think anybody would argue that lowering emissions is, is um, a poor choice. Um, however, I think people have to accept that this is a modern world and we just need to um, allow people to be able to access the, um, the needs and um, facilities that we've made available for them. Um, and if people can't ride a bike um, and can't get on public transport easily for some reason, then their only option, and, and perhaps they can't walk either for, for long distances, 
their only option is a motor vehicle. Um, I actually really feel that this um, discussion is should be brought back to the cycle lanes and where they are placed. I think that's that's the important thing that we're here to discuss today. Um, and that, that really needs to be the point of this discussion. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Jenny and then Cecile again. Thanks. Um, my question that's probably gonna be a little bit for Cecile, but I'd be happy to hear from other people who might wanna add in after that. But we've had a couple of suggestions today. Um, Judith Gray and, and Renee are, are saying we should move the cycle way off of the main Johnsonville Road. And John Biggerhole, you've made a suggestion about how we could perhaps have a, a cycleway that's not along the main road in Crory. And I guess, you know, Cecile, we kind of have that experience in Tawa where we do have quite a great shared pathway, um, acknowledging Alan that there are limitations to shared pathways, but we do have one, but it doesn't actually go to the main road. And what are the challenges that that presents to you, Cecile, in terms of actually trying to go about your day-to-day -day life rather than perhaps somebody who's just trying to zip to the city to get to work? Yeah, so um, like I said, um, uh, once I, uh, let me see, so I'll take the shared pathway, but once I need to actually, the, uh, have to get onto the road as soon as I get to the closest corner of, um, to get to the school, like I, uh, I'll get down to Redwood Station and then I have to go onto Tower Street and then ma the main road to get to the school. And then if I want to go to the shops, I have to stay on the main road because there's no linkage to um, from to the shops. I, I basically have to stay on the stay on the main road. And any of the shops along the main road, I have to stay on the main road. I can't use the shared pathway because the shared pathway is great for just going from station to station. But um, if you want to, um, you want to see any of the shops, any of the yeah, any of the schools. You you have to leave the shared pathway. Except, uh, yeah, I think that that yeah. Oh, and um, sorry, I was gonna um, I was gonna raise something about um as well. Uh, I I know um about the mobility. I know one of the um, one of my my couple of my neighbors have um mobility scooters that they use on the shared pathway. Um, obviously because they also have um mobility issues, so. Yeah, um, so that's what they've ended up doing. I think he, pref yeah, he, he prefers the shared pathway because it's wider than the footpath across the road. Yeah, just, yeah. So. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, do you want to ask another question, Jenny? Um, well, I saw John had some comments in the chat. I don't know if he wanted to, to quickly add anything there. And then I did have another question for Judas if there's time. Yeah, well, I, I just thought, uh, Judith and Renee, your point about, you know, you want to discuss where to put them. Um, so, uh, John, do you just want to talk a little bit more to that? And then Judith and Renee, whether you want to have another comment, and Joey as well, and Colin, if, yeah, just give everyone a chance. Um, no, look, I think, I think the point has been well made that cycle paths can't just be for commuters whipping down into town and then back out again. Um, if you really, if we really want to make a change to how Wellingtonians think about space and how they use their space, um, then there need to be cycle paths that work for communities so that people can cycle within the community and between communities as well as to the CBD and back out. Thank you. Thank you. Joey, Colin, do you want to, do you want to have a say, Judith? Yeah, Joey. Um, I was just thinking about, yeah, like what I was talking about, not on the main roads. I'm thinking like when I when I go into the city, I'm literally pre-planning my route to, so I know I have to avoid certain areas. Like I'm thinking Courtney Place, I've got to avoid that, it's scary buses. Um, pre-planning, like I need to knit down Opera House Lane and then cut across to get to the waterfront. Um, I think this kind of like, because there's no existing cycleways like in the city, it's kind of a place to avoid. Um, and it kind of evolve, involves planning, even for me that like I know the city really well and I kind of know where all the bike parks are. But um, I can just imagine that must put people off thinking about it just being an overwhelming experience. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Alan? Yeah, I, I think what I was going to say sort of uh, being superseded by some of the comments. In, in my perception, people, 
maybe 30 years too late, are now getting um, far more aware of the current carbon emissions issues and at least showing some willingness to address it than was the case a while ago. I don't know whether council wants to put more resources into doing that. I, I, maybe more of a central government issue. The second thing is that um, when I talked about footpaths for feet and kids up to five years old, maybe, I was not meaning to exclude mobility scooters. They travel along not much faster than I walk. <laughs> and it's certainly nothing like the pace of hot blooded 18 year olds as I was once. Um, and finally, um, some of the points that John Vigorhold has been making, I would strongly, endorse. in fact, not some of them, great majority of them, I would strongly endorse. Cheers. Thank you. Ellen? Thanks. Um, I just, I, I think, I think what's Fleur's question about climate change is quite important. And it kind of relates a bit back to what I was saying at the beginning that walking's important, biking's important, and so is catching public transport. And what we're trying to sell is just biking. And we miss it, we're losing the picture of how, how it all works together. Because like I think somebody else was saying that not everybody can use everything. So it needs to be, we need to sell it as a thing that this is going to be better for everybody. We're going to be healthier. We're going to be out in our community. We're going to be able to, to move about how we need to move. And it's going to be easier to walk or to bike because we're going to make it so much better. So you won't have to think, oh, I might have to go in my car. You'll think, you know, if Cecile just go, oh, I can just bike there. You know, it's not, it's, that's what we kind of want to end up at. But we're, we're just selling things and it feels in some I think a lot of people feel like it's taking something away from them it, it's not this is giving a future and a whole other thing so I think that's really important and I think John also mentioned that speed was really important now the central city is supposed to be a 30 kilometer an hour zone for most of it but you wouldn't know um, unless you're paying attention that that anything has changed when you move into the 30 kilometer an hour zone and so making it look like a low speed happy cycling environment is really important. And we haven't, we've done the speed limit, which is really a first step, but we need to take the design thing to the next level. And just, I, I wanna come back to what, what's happened to the um, cycle lane along the quays. So that's a key bit of connecting everything up. So um, yeah, that's my tuppence again. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, um, thanks, Iona. Um, following on from Alan, um, I'm just interested um, in our submitters' views on um, how we incentivise um, behavioural um, cultural changes across the modes, and if anybody has um, some ideas, yeah, you know, I'm I'm concerned that you know, we 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 right across, and I'm not not being um, critical of one mode or another, but there are um, behaviours that that really aren't that acceptable. How, how do we incentivise um, changing those behaviours? Thanks. Anyone want to have a go at that? Joey? I just know my behaviour is shaped by cycling amongst traffic. Um, it makes me very a very defensive, kind of sometimes offensive cyclist. Like I know a car is going to cut me off, so I'll be in the middle to make sure they don't. And it just sort of, I think, by having your own segregated cycleway, you can relax a little more, go at your own pace not be in a rush. So I think I think the, the existence of a cycleway goes a long way. Um, but yeah, when they're forced to, when you're on and off again in, in front of cars, you kind of, you have, to act, you have to act like a car if you're on the road, is basically what I'm trying to say. So I think just segregated cycleways would naturally shift. Yeah, can I um, just elaborate a little more on that? that that's just, great, Joey. Just, Quite clear because um, Judith and Renee, I think, want to say something. We've got to wrap up reasonably soon. Okay, I'll let them go. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Um, you talked about incentivizing uh, changes of behaviour. Uh, you're not going to get all the cars off the road. So I think, first of all, we need to accept that. I think if you want to incentivize people to cycle, and uh, care about the emissions, uh, reducing the emissions and people's health and so forth, you provide a safe route 
for them to cycle. And you also allow cars to be uh, and car parks to be available for people that choose or have to choose vehicle access. Um, and that way you also incentivize businesses to keep going that uh, pay for the roads uh, through their taxes. So I think there is a way to, you know, keep everybody happy and safe. Uh, but I think uh, you need to consider some of the matters that have been stated here today. And surely safety and keeping people, uh, you know, moving is the most important thing. Thank you. Just something else to add on that. I believe John earlier said, and the statement's been floating around in my mind, is the length of cycle routes, whether they're shorter, aren't always safer. Um, so just reiterating on that, sort of whether we do have to detour and make the cycle lane not down a main road, yeah, going through a couple of wee suburbs just to make sure and secure the cyclist's safety, but it, making sure that it's, yes, a road with still cars on it, but where there's room to ensure the safety of the cyclist, where there is more room on the road for a cycle lane. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we do need to wrap up reasonably soon. Are there just any final thoughts from submitters that you really wanted to put across? Um, um, uh, I've just wanted to add, um, um, uh, like I, I, I like the sh shared pathway in that there is a, a pathway, but I would also prefer a separated cycleway because I do encounter a lot of students along my route and they do take, take, tend to take up the whole pathway. Um, so, I mean, it's fine, I'll slow down, but you know, it's, um, I, you know, I, I don't wanna stop completely because they're taking forever blocking the whole area. So, and also I, I also don't like cycling on the footpath, but I don't really have a choice because I don't want to be on the road. But you know, it, it, it does worry me because if suddenly someone comes out of a door as, I, as I'm riding past, I mean, I don't go that fast, but yeah, um, I do worry about that. Or even a car, as a car is backing out of parking, I also worry about that. Um, I've had a couple of near misses, not that near, but you know, near enough that I'm, it, it uh, I, I remember it now. So yeah, that's that's my, I guess yes. I would like more cycleways, but I also am aware that there's not a lot of space, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Alan. I just want to say that um, more biking's good, more walking's good, more bus and public transport use is good. It's got to work for everybody. Sure. Thank you. Anything else? All right, well, look, thank you. That's incredibly valuable. And of course, we did um, read your um, submission. So we've got all that and we will take that all on board um, when we come for um, deliberations. So thank you very much. You've got busy lives and we appreciate um, your guidance in our work. Um, Councillors, we're going to be back at uh, 12.30 for the next session. So I hope you have a good lunch. Um, and to the submitters again, thank you. And I hope you also have a good lunch. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Very constructive. Thank you. Thank you. Kakite, thank you again. Thanks. Yeah. Welcome to you. Thank you. Warm welcome to you all. Thank you so much for giving up your valuable time. Um, and what we'll do is just uh, uh, say who we are and then tag someone else to introduce themselves. So Councillor Fitzsimons, would you like to start this time? Uh, kia ora, Fleur Fitzsimons, Councillor for the Paikawakawa Southern Ward, and I'll tag Jenny. Kia ora, I'm Jenny Condi, I'm a Councillor for Takapu Northern Ward. And I'll tag General. Thank you, Jenny, uh, Councillor Condi. Um, um, General Fernandez, um, part of the uh, member of the Tawa Community Board. And I'll tag uh, Leandra. Good, everyone. My name's Leandra, and I'm just part of the Youth Council. Um, I'll tag uh, Lucy. 
Kia ora, my name's Lucy Stewart uh, and I live in Wadestown making a personal submission. I'll tag Ella. Kia ora, my name is Ella and I am the Deputy Chair of the Wellington City Youth Council um, and I will tag, oh, who hasn't gone, James? Hi, I'm James, I live in Tawa, I travel all around Wellington and I'll tag, I don't know who else, is there anybody? I'll go. Um, hi there. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Simon Wolf, um, councillor for um, Faringing Onzo Western Ward. Good to see you all. And I will tag. Have you got a go, Terry? No, not yet. Thanks, Simon. No, no. Um, kia ora. I'm councillor Terry O'Neill, and I represent Timotu Kairangi, the eastern suburbs. And I will tag Nadine. Uh, my name is Nadine Dodge. I am making a submission as an individual living in Aro Valley, but I also do have background as a transport planner as well. And I think, uh, Joe, are you the last one to go? I think. Uh, hello, everyone. Joe Hewitt. Uh, I'm an officer advising the councillors on the bike and epic plan. We have Anastasia. Oh yeah. Hi, my name is Anastasia and I'm from Youth Council and I'll be submitting with Ella and Leandra from Youth Council as well. Fantastic. And Heidi and Emily? Kia ora koto. I'm Heidi. I'm a democracy advisor and you will have had a lot of emails from me about coordinating this forum. So thank you very much for all of your patience and thanks for coming. Oh, kia ora. Um, I'm a democracy advisor as well. Thanks. And uh, kia ora everyone, um, um, ko Iona Panada Ho, um, I'm um, one of the councillors for the Pukahino um, Ward. Uh, so again, a warm welcome. So basically what we're going to do is everyone's going to have um, five minutes just to speak to their submission. You can take them as read, we'll read all of them. Um, and then there'll be time for some discussion and questions. So whoever wants to go first, is brave enough to go first, we'd love to hear what you've got to say. If everyone wants to be quiet, I can jump in. Okay, good um, on you, Nadine. Yeah, I guess I'll start by saying that I think uh, that council has done an amazing job putting this together. It's really great to see an evidence-based way and a strategic way of going forward with what to do next. Um, in particular, I think the idea of doing the rapid rollout in a more fast transitional way of doing things that's also more affordable and more agile is a great way forward. Um, the only suggestion I had for a change was to extend the primary network um, in Aro Valley to the end of Aro Street. And I have two reasons for thinking that, maybe three reasons for thinking that. One, it's quite an important route for commuters, but also to support recreation in Wellington. The Pull Hill Warmapihi Reserve is very heavily used by lots and lots of mountain bikers from all over the place. And currently you will see that many, many of them are driving to the area uh, and parking in the area, probably because they don't actually feel safe to go there on their mountain bikes. Um, the second reason beyond that is that um, it's actually a pretty high level of cycling area and has much higher cycling levels than other parts that have been identified as a primary network. Um, so in December, 2021, the most recent data on the council website, um, in one direction, RO Street had 4,100 cyclists and Brooklyn Hill only had 3,200 cyclists, even though Brooklyn Hill has a cycleway and RO Street doesn't. Um, it also had 21% more cyclists than Glenmore Street and 141% more cyclists than um, Seachun, which is currently on the primary network. Um, RO Street is much, much closer to the central city than Seachun. Um, and it just doesn't quite make sense to me why it wouldn't be in the primary network given that it seems like there's quite high potential to, to support commuting, given how close it is to the central city, but also to improve recreation and having people bike to go mountain biking instead of drive. Um, so that's that's it for me. Um, thanks very much, everybody, for all your hard work on, on the plan. Oh, thank you. That's, that's wonderfully succinct, Nadine. Thank you. Um, who would like to go next? Um, I can take it up by beginning the Youth Council's perspective. Wonderful. So first of all, I think it's pretty easy to say that we're all highly for this proposition and we're all quite excited for it. 
Um, we've kind of gathered some data. So first of all, we understand that 34% of Wellington's emissions do come from road transport. So we feel like introducing the cycleway could transfer people from their private vehicles to using the cycleway for walking, pedestrians, or even biking. That could kind of lead to the eventual decrease of this threat, especially considering that we're aiming for a less carbon polluted uh, city. Um, next, we feel that this will provide a quite alternative attraction, especially for the youth of the city, seeing as though we can speak from that perspective. I know from experience that me and my friends do like to walk around rather than Ubering or busing to kind of save costs while it might take more time, we still choose to that way. So I feel the cycleway could kind of help us even consider bringing bikes into the city, cycling around, and that could just be more of an attractive option where we know that we're safe and we're looked out for. Kind of also gives us purpose to use this because we feel like we're contributing more, as I said before, to that sustainability image, which is really, really attractive and motivating and can kind of stimulate physical connection and I guess activity for, yeah, for us. Wonderful, thank you. Ella, Anastasia. Anastasia, do you want to go next? Oh, you can go, Ella, I don't mind, I'll go after you. Uh, Easy. Um, so I'm just going to quickly speak to our support of the interim solutions. Um, both as a way of being able to test out what people like and the way the cycleways will work, and also as a way of making sure that we get this done as soon as possible because it's such a positive thing, and we really would love to have um, many more cycleways in the city as soon as possible. So, um, yeah, the interim solutions is something that Youth Council wholeheartedly supports. Um, I'll go now. Um, so we, we definitely support this and we love this new plan, but we're really focused on making sure that it's safe for young people and accessible for all kinds of young people. There are a lot of young people who have difficulty biking due to mental disabilities and physical disabilities and making sure that our transport system is still reliable enough in order to make sure that these people can also move around and get around Wellington because right now it's not and right now a lot of parents don't actually feel like they can put their young kids um, on buses because it's too you know it's too complicated you have to get three different buses to get from A to B or something something like that so making sure that even though biking is great and we should get heaps of people on the bikes people need to feel safe and that also comes in for everyone learning the road rules making sure that everyone knows how around about works or what traffic how the traffic lights like where they're placed and everything like that I know it's quite simple stuff but some young people just have no idea until they sit their learners test about how all the road road rules work so um I think that's about everything from me about that um yeah thank you is there anything else you'd like to add okay we'll we'll get on to discussion after the other submitters um Who'd like to go next? I can go next. Thank you. Um, so kia ora everybody. I'm just going to quickly give you some context for my comments. Uh, I now live in Wadestown. I commute by cycle into the CBD. I also commuted out to the hut um, for a while by bicycle. But I grew up in Brooklyn um, in the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, and my parents still live there. So I am really invested in being able to cycle to see my parents, which I can do technically now, um, but it's it's not a whole lot of fun, I gotta say. Um, and my, my major comment on the cycleway plan is I actually cried the first time I read it because as someone living in the western suburbs in Wadestown, this is the first time in you know seven years of being back in Wellington as an adult that I have seen a plan that actually acknowledges cyclists live in this area and deserve infrastructure. Um, I know a lot of infrastructure has been put in over the last few years literally none of it has improved any of the routes I cycle except uh, the Tory Street um, bike access opening up again onto the waterfront um, but I have a bit more to say about that later uh, so I, I fully support um, the concept uh, as other people have said I think the interim staging is a really great idea because as a cyclist um, and as a driver you know, what I really notice is the big barrier to cycling is the entitlement of people who are only drivers um, and don't use mixed modes of transport. And the only way to get around that is to put facilities in and kind of get them to learn to deal with them. Because um, I think what we've seen is that uh, if you uh, if you consult people forever, then the people who only drive um, just refuse to contemplate that other people also have a right to use the road. So I'm really excited by this plan. 
um, but I have three, three comments on it. The first is I referred to using the Torrey Street to the waterfront connection, which I do every time I commute into the CBD. Uh, I think more attention needs to be paid to how the bits of, these bits of the cycleway are going to connect up because that's currently considered a completed connection. Uh, but coming through there, I know that theoretically, according to the map, you're supposed to go around behind to Papa some, somehow on the seaward side of it. I have literally never figured out how you are supposed to safely get there because you're supposed to what like go through the car park or go down that little side street and like there's no it's totally bizarre so no one does that we all go in front of Tapapa and then through the Tapapa forecourt and actually the most useful piece of cycle infrastructure that's been put in has been that they've shortened the bar for the bit the buses go through in front of Tapapa so you can cycle along, along the road there and Tapapa did that as far as I know the council didn't um, so I think attention really needs to be paid to those connections and making it possible for new cyclists who don't know areas to know where they are going from one bit to another um, or people are going to get lost lost and confused and not be able to find their way around. The second thing is um, I'm quite concerned by figure 18, which is on page 45, which is the bike network catchment. Um, so this is, you know, a 500 meter catchment for people to be able to get to the proposed network of cycleways. Um, if you look at the Brooklyn, Mornington, Kingston area, which I know because I grew up there, uh, and uh, Ohara Road uh, cycle cycleway is shown as taking in all of Mornington and its catchment. Um, but anyone who lives in the area knows that actually the last realistic connection from the Mornington on the top of the hill to Ohara Road is in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Center near the shops. There are actually no streets connecting the two. So this is showing a catchment that literally doesn't exist. And I don't know all the other areas well enough to know where that's happening. Um, but someone really needs to go this go through this and we need a catchment plan that shows catchments in terms of how long it actually takes to cycle to a cycle way not as the crow flies what 500 meters away is because that's that's not realistic and I I worry um that it's giving a false impression of how accessible these cycleways actually are and limiting the number of needed cycleways whereas I for Brooklyn Brooklyn and Mornington Kingston you really need a cycleway along the ridge for that to be accessible to people who live there um, my last comment is about measurement. So I know there's a lot of great measurement of how many cyclists are using different areas and that's being used to create this. As a cyclist living in the western suburbs, again, um, I know that my commute and the commute of many other people I see, uh, we were mostly coming up and down Molesworth and Murphy streets, we're coming up Wadestown Hill, that is not captured by any current measurement. Um, so there are whole groups of cyclists who are not being captured and they're not, not really being taken into account as much for this planning. Um, and for as planning goes forward for this, I would really like to see that happening. So it's really well understood where cyclists are in the city and where they're going in areas that have not traditionally been considered uh, as cyclable, um, but now are because of e-bikes. Thank you. Thank you, very clear. Right, next Sabina. Okay, I'll, um, uh, I'll speak next. So everybody's been speaking really eloquently and this is gonna be a very tough crowd. You're all gonna hate me because I have, a, I have a different perspective. So this is a personal submission that I'm making, uh, but it's in line with uh, a lot of the work that I do, uh, particularly in the transport sector. So it's not going to be as aligned with the other views that we've heard this morning. Um, it is a personal submission, uh, but it does come from the multiple perspectives of a person who is a pedestrian, a cyclist and a motorist. I, I am all three. Um, I'm a believer in climate change and the need to reduce emissions. However, I'm also mindful of this, the limited space that we have in Wellington and the practical and impractical aspects of rolling out vast stretches of cycleways that adversely affect traffic flows around the city. Uh, cycleways impact a greater number of people, uh, far greater than the number I believe uh, who have made submissions so far. Um, the reason for this lack of engagement are many and beyond the scope of the discussion today, uh, but I'm, belief that, I'm of the belief that the majority of respondents are special interest groups. In fact, to a certain extent, I am a special interest group as well. Um, there exists a silent majority uh, that share the frustrations of cycleway development, not only in our region, but indeed nationwide. Uh, some of the feedback that I've encountered are just from Luddites who are just completely opposed to change, so we can dismiss those. Uh, but some of the other opposition does come about from solid points that are based in practicality. Um, 
I think that really in a, in a lot of ways with the way that this is being rolled out from, from the perspective of, of, of business and a, and a lot of Wellingtonians is that there's this sense that council has decided to do this and then the engagement process starts afterwards and it's essentially um, a, a box ticking exercise. We, maybe we can make a couple of changes here and there, uh, but everything has pretty much been predetermined. Um, I also have concerns around uh, some of the things that have been that have been considered or that haven't been considered. Um, the lack of weight that's attached to the challenges posed by Wellington's geography, uh, both in terms of steep terrain as well as a lack of space with which we can widen roadways. Uh, the lack of weight attached to the climate and weather patterns, which discourage many from cycling. Uh, the lack of practicality in many instances of traveling by bike, uh, particularly for professionals. Um, also, when we need to transport other people around, particularly young and elderly family members. Uh, when we have goods to transport, I mean, that can include groceries. I know that some people are able to, to do so. Um, issues around professionals, uh, professional presentation and hygiene when arriving at work after a long bike commute for those that don't have um, the ability to be able to, to shower and change their clothes. Um, there are figures that have been quoted in various council meetings that I've attended over the past few months um, where there's been an equating of bike sales figures to the number of willing, the number of people who are willing to commute by bike. And I don't think that that is an accurate representation. Um, once again, I know that these are not going to be so popular in this particular forum, but I, I am going to voice them. Um, and there's been a comparison with other cities and the space that they have, um, which fails to take into account the, the extra space that they have in terms of being able to widen roads. Um, in some cases, the other cities that have been used as a comparison have had favorable climates and weather patterns for cyclists and flatter terrain. Um, I understand that there is a shift towards the perception that cars are bad, and that from both an environmental as well as a safety perspective, uh, there are many truths to this. However, um, as we work towards transitioning from fossil fuels to hybrid technologies and to EVs, the environmental aspects are somewhat mitigated um, or displaced, uh, depending on your point of view. Uh, by eroding the space for motor vehicles, we are reducing the infrastructure for modes of transport, which are overwhelmingly favoured and make it increasingly difficult for public transport providers to operate. I'm not saying that there isn't a space for cyclists on the road. I'm just saying that there are, we, we often talk about sharing the road, um, but that concept of sharing really comes at the cost of, of, of motorists. Um, many submissions ignore the views of business, so I'm here to, to, to present that. Um, now I understand that it is people that make a city, right? It's, um, it's, and it's those people that should indeed be heard um, and have a greater say in a democracy as opposed to some big corporation that can influence policy based on the depth of its pockets. Um, some may go so far as to say motor vehicles and businesses are evil and both should be done away with. However, it is business that has provided the food we eat, the computers and phones that we are having this meeting on and supplying almost every other thing we consume. Even the bikes we ride on uh, need to be transported to the stores as we certainly aren't riding them from the factories to our homes to begin with. Um, the expansion of the cycle network on our narrow roads has real world effects on traffic congestion and the length of time it takes to travel the ability for goods and passenger service vehicles to be able to park, and the amount of CO2 emissions brought about from poorer traffic flow. We also see significant congestion on our roads and suffer from a lack of parking spaces. I believe that a lot of these proposals, and I'm talking about things in general without identifying uh, particular routes, um, favor, uh, have, have significant real world issues in favor of ideolog ideological solutions. Um, that I don't believe will necessarily bear the fruit that a lot of people are espousing. And I hope that I'm proven wrong with this, um, but that's how I feel at this stage uh, from a practical perspective. Um, we simply do not have roads that are wide enough to be able to handle the volume of road traffic we currently have at many times of the day. And by reducing the space, we only exacerbate this problem. Um, I have real trouble believing that any person realistically believes that cycleways will become anywhere near as utilized as a motor vehicle lane. Um, in the future. Uh, in fact, I'm going, willing to go so far as to say that the idealistic proposals of cycleway solving our congestion problems is a distraction from the lack of effective government planning and action over the years. I'm talking about decades, um, which has contributed to many of the issues that we now face and that we will continue to face in the future. 
Um, cycles are indeed being pushed under the guise of a green initiative. And while I believe that there is indeed substance to that, I also believe that cycleways are seen as quick wins and easy solutions for the congestion problems that our city faces. Uh, cyclists are pitted against motorists, and this poses a dilemma for those of us that are both. Um, we share the roads, and we should share the roads, and we should act in both a safe and courteous manner. Um, as a cyclist, I've, been, uh, I've absolutely hated some of the motorists that I've encountered. And as a motorist, I've absolutely hated some of the cyclists I've encountered. So I get to feel it from, from both sides. Um, I feel that the rollout of the cycle lanes is increasing the animosity, particularly when there is a widely held view that roading infrastructure is heavily funded by motorists through petrol taxes and other road user charges, while cyclists contribute very little financially. Um, I know that's just one portion of it. Um, I believe my submission represents the concerns of many Wellingtonians who remain silent in this consultation process, and that many of the submissions are made by special interest groups, including myself. I believe my submission addresses many real world concerns that are not given appropriate consideration as they are not politically convenient. Uh, and disappointingly, like many Wellingtonians, I believe that there is a predetermined agenda to roll this out and that many decision makers in this process are also closely affiliated with cycle groups. I hope I am incorrect with, on these points and that this consultation process is not simply a box ticking exercise where the results would be skewed to simply justify a project that will diminish the real world requirements our city has for its roads. Sorry, I had to read that because I made a couple of notes prior to this to make sure that I stayed and covered all of my topics. But thanks thanks for hearing me out. Great. Thanks, James. Appreciate your passion. Um, right. And the Tower Community Board. Now, sorry, it was Janel. Janel, yep. Thank you, Councillor Pennett. Um, first, I'd like to thank the, uh, the Council for this initiative. Uh, I thought this is a a really good initiative that would encourage uh, more people to uh, to bike. And my my particular submission is uh, around the Middleton Road, the connection between Tawa and uh, and Johnsonville. Um, we know that that is not a very wide road, and so. Uh, my particular submission is around ensuring that that whatever uh, intervention we put there, that it would be ideally a separated cycleway because uh, as it is, that road uh, is uh, narrow, too narrow. And then if, if it'll be a shared space, it'll just be terrible. As James was talking about earlier, it'll be terrible for both the, the cyclist and, and, the, uh, and the motorist. Um, and then, uh, from uh, wearing a Tawa Community Board hat, uh, and my my chair may have intimated this already, um, we would have appreciated it if uh, before the consultation to the public happened that some of the details, particularly in the Tawa area, uh, were consulted with the Tawa Community Board first. And uh, there were some details there that we weren't aware of, which we, we have some concerns about. And so uh, uh, th that's one thing that uh, I would also like to uh, raise uh, to, with the council. So that, that's uh, basically uh, my, my submission. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, that was incredibly helpful. It's definitely not a tick uh, box exercise. Um, Usually I've started off with councillors asking questions, but I'm just wondering if the submitters would like to um, ask any questions of clarification or make any points, because um, we are trying to have a bit of a dialogue. I do have a question, uh, Councillor Pennett. Great. So how does the council determine whether it will be a, a separated cycleway or it will be a shared Mixed traffic, is it a bike path or a bike lane? How, how is that decision made? That's a very good question. I mean, I think uh, we've got our technical staff here, so Joe will be able to give you a, a better idea. But I, you know, I guess obviously we just have to look at um, the priority and where it is in the hierarchy and what the individual road conditions are and what we can do. But Joe, do you want to just start off? Yeah, thanks, Councillor Pennant. So I mean, obviously, that, that is a, a tricky um, technical um, question. 
and um, you know bespoke solutions need to be developed for um, you know each place, um, each street. Bearing in mind that we're also um, taking a multimodal approach to these corridor transformations, so that's making um, good provisions for walking, cycling, and public transport. Now, achieving the ideal solution in every particular location um, is clearly not um, not achievable. Um, but that's the design process and so how we make those decisions is that um, we're proposing to do a transition um, trial process where um, design work will be done we will um, implement a, um, a street change and then uh, work with the the community and um, understand how well that's working or not and, and adjust it as necessary um, and then uh, kind of following that transition process, um, we would then embark on the more traditional um, design process for the permanent changes uh, that we would then progress through that kind of normal um, design approval and implementation process. Some of those things um, could be years apart. And, you know, in, in places, um, oh, I hate to say it, but in places like Island Bay, you know, there's no transition scheme. The, we're just in the design process. Um, something like Brooklyn Hill, where we have trialed a scheme, we are now in the design process and we'll be coming back to the community, um, you know, with the, with the draft final scheme plan um, over the next year. Is that enough? Yeah, great. Terry, do you want to have a go now? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, my question was for the participant, James, so taking all of your points on board. I was just wondering if you could point maybe for us um, any specific changes in the network that you would like to see, or maybe an example of a cycleway in Wellington that you do like, and maybe one that you don't. Like, what's a good example of the issues that you're talking about? Um, I've, I've been taking a look at... We, we, if we take a look at some of the proposals that are coming out at the moment, if we take a look at the new town to, to Courtney Place proposal, I think that there are many, many parts of that cycleway that do work. I'm, I'm not opposed to having the cycleway. I think that there are element, that there are aspects of that, like particularly around the front of Wellington Hospital, which are impractical. And it seems like we are just attempting to cram things in, in there. Uh, the, the Evans Bay Cobham Drive has been a big issue um, relatively recently. Um, and these off-road cycleways work out really well. Um, I think that some of the concerns that I have, I mean, e even around Oriental Bay, I think that's working out quite well where it's, where it's separated off because it's, there wasn't enough space to be able to maintain 1.5 um, metre distance between the, the side mirror of a car and, um, and, and a cyclist. Uh, without that car bearing onto the opposite side of the of the road. Um, I also do have some concerns as an ex-Island Bay resident um, about the Island Bay cycleway. I think that in many cases, you know, that, that was a good opportunity for us to, to learn a lot about what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing with cycleways. And I find it's quite disappointing that we're increasingly rolling out more and more of these cycleways without even being able to properly address the Island Bay um, the Island Bay cycleway. Um, to me, it's like that, that's a, that's a, that's a, it, from a private business perspective. I mean, that's what we kind of do. We have a we have a test area, we play around with it, we work out how it works, and then once we've refined it, then we start to roll it out in other areas. Um, the the expansion of the expansion of cycleways has real real impacts to businesses, particularly where we're starting to see the removal of a lot of parking spaces. And I think that along Thorndon Key is a good example. I had to go down to New Zealand uniforms the other day. And with the removal of the diagonal parking spaces down there, 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 there just isn't enough parking and the retailers there are suffering. Um, my concern is partially due to the, some of the cycleways that are in place, but it's the other things that are going to be rolled out. Um, and the concerns of and the concerns of business primarily around that. Okay, thank you, um, Nadine. Can I just ask you a question? If you're there, um, sorry, not that I should be, you know, yep. borrowing from your professional expertise, um, but I'm particularly vexed by loading zones at the moment. Be a nice one asking that. Um, where, you know, it's obviously critical to get goods to businesses. You know, that's otherwise apart from anything we can't eat um 
How do we do that when there's a fundamental conflict with getting people through uh, busy roads safely, but there aren't easy answers to those loading zones? No, and I think one is really having your parking hierarchy right and understanding that loading zones are going to be really, really high up on the hierarchy in most places, unless you can service places, everyone has their own off-street servicing. Um, but I think the thing that Wellington can improve a lot is using space flexibly. And a really good example of this is Cuba Street, where Cuba Street actually, the you may not notice it, but from, I think it's like nine to 11 in the morning, loading zones can use the Cuba Street pedestrian mall area and the couriers or whoever will go at the speed of the, the pedestrians park there and then they, they have to leave before the primary busy pedestrian time. And I think in the future, there'll just have to be a lot more of that. And that might mean it's a loading zone at a particular time of day, a bus, zone, a bus lane at another time, and actually realizing that in the future, we need to take care of our precious curbside resource you know, more, more carefully. And um, in the future, businesses aren't gonna be able to load at any time, or which is also not very good for pedestrians as well if it's, you know, really busy, you know, we see this on Lambden Key where people are trying to load big pallets onto the footpath in the middle of the day. That's not a good thing either. Um, so I think there is an opportunity to maintain loading, but using it more uh, intelligently in the future. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, questions of possibly of Lucy and the Youth Council. Um, Sorry, just yeah. to follow up on that last point, from a business perspective, I mean, we can we can take a look, and idealistically, we, we can indeed say that along Lambton Key, a courier should only be able to pick up and drop off within a certain point of time, but couriers are constantly busy servicing all of the businesses along this way, and what we really need to realise is that that Lambton Key and, and many other parts of the city aren't just two-dimensional looking at it on a map. There are multiple businesses in the buildings above what we see at the ground level. And it just simply isn't practical. And I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be doing the business community any kind of favors by remaining silent on this to, to sit by and say, no, it is practical for couriers and, and loading zones to be able to operate within a small period of the day. And that's going to be able to adequately service businesses in the CBD. Um, I just don't believe that's right. Okay, thanks for that view. Um, Leander, uh, Leandra, sorry. Yes. Hi, I've just got a simple surface question here. For what will be learnt from sort of the Oriental Cycleway, will this be more accessible and more practical in any way? For example, information signs or bike stands, anything along those lines? So what did we learn from that particular cycleway was your question? Yeah. Joe, do you want to have a go at that? Apart from the fact it was a great success, like, you know, it's in my neighbourhood, you know, there was enough room to separate out the cyclists and the pedestrians. That was that was a big thing. But, yeah, you know, Joe, do you have anything? Yeah, well, I think that the, the, the number one lesson is around that, that, um, you know, where we can achieve separated space, um, you know, that's that's obviously the ideal, um, you know, best practice is, is to provide suitable space. Um, I think the point around... Um, enabling facilities like bike parking and those kind of things our approach to that is generally um, to respond to that because it's it's kind of a lower level of investment um, and and our response to that is to respond to it on an as needed basis so as the activity picks up and, and and the use of places change um, you know we can come back in and uh, add things like additional bike parking and that kind of facility thank you Jenny Thanks. I was just um, interested to hear from Lucy and, and possibly Nadine as well as cyclists and, and possibly cyclists who have used Thought and Key because James brought that one up. But I just, how you feel about that, um, that balance between trying to make cyclists feel safe and like they can use the space versus the inconvenience that might be created for James to have to park further away and walk um, to where he might want to get to. Did, was there anything that, that you could comment on about that? So I can say um, I go to Thorndon Key, you know, reasonably frequently, probably once a month. I drive a lot of the time uh, because as it has been, I have not felt safe to cycle. Um, it is at a distance where if 
um especially now that angle parking has been taken out I'm not going a lot out a lot right now because of Omicron but like I will already feel immensely safer as a driver I already feel safer go, um, driving there because it was intensely stressful to back out of those angle parks like I was always terrified I was going to hit someone I hadn't seen I think a lot of the time um actually making it safer for cyclists makes it less stressful for drivers and also encourages people to think about you know what how they're going to get somewhere um, and what actually is the most efficient way to do it um yeah mm, yeah I, I think i would echo that as well um thorninke is actually somewhere that one of the few places in wellington that i refuse to go cycling after a car backed into me and then chased after me and threatened to kill me for being on the road. And I just said, I'm not going there anymore. And I like Bordeaux pastries, but I can't have them anymore. Um, <laughs> and the, the other part I think that Thorn and Key shows is that data collection is really, really important. And having the parking sensors and actually knowing what's going on and being able to have a monitoring plan about actually what's going on with the parking is really, really important. Um, and that actually links back to your question, Iona, about the loading zones. And I know that an issue that has been in the past is the loading zones don't have sensors on them. And also you don't necessarily need a permit to use a loading zone. So actually, um, I think that loading zone is an example where if you did have the data monitoring in the parking centers and you did have a permit program so that you knew that people were who are using the loading zones were legitimate business needs, not just someone abusing the loading zone being available. Um, those are really important aspects as well as you continue to roll these things out. Great, um, Ella, thanks. Hey, yeah, um, I just have a question about the impact on businesses. Um, just because the studies that I've read from cities across the world show that bike lane, I mean, businesses along bike lanes greatly benefit um, from the implementation of cycleways. So I'm wondering if there's been any analysis of the data in Wellington as to the impact on businesses with cycleways. Uh, look, I think I can answer that one uh, fairly easily. There, there was um, a little study done uh, many years ago um, about the people using kind of active modes um, to access uh, businesses in Courtney Place and I think it was Ridderford Street and somewhere else, um, maybe uh, on the terrace. Um, and the headline on the report was something like, um, well, I'm going to get this wrong, I'm sure. There, there was a lot more people using those modes to get to the places than, than people thought. Um, but kind of to James's point, the majority of people, you know, at this time, well, at that time, um, were still arriving um, by by car. So maybe 60%, whereas, you know, kind of the, the neighbours typically thought it was higher than that. In answer to you, have we got data? Well, the, the kind of the, the frank answer to that is that we really haven't developed any new good cycleways in places where we can collect that kind of data. Um, so, you know, obviously we are very interested in that question ourselves and we'll certainly be looking to, to do that. Um, but, you know, e even the changes in Thorn and Key aren't kind of the permanent changes um, or anything at this stage. Things like that are being monitored. Um, but, you know, th this really isn't enough to, um, to, to be able to tell our own story around that. Thank you. Thank you. Lucy. Um. I just, I, I would just like to ask about um, the thinking that's been done around areas where it is more likely we're going to have shared areas than separated cycleways. For instance, like I said, I live in Wadestown. I come along Maidangi Road, um, the bit sort of from, from Wadestown through Wilton. Uh, I have a really hard time picturing that we're going to have a fully separated cycleway along there anytime in the next like 10 years um, because it's, it's not very wide and a lot of people are parking parking on the street I know the parking policy is changing but it seems to me like it's more likely it would be shared so I'm just wondering what the planning is in terms of thinking about um like traffic calming measures speed limits that sort of thing because I don't actually mind sharing my dungy road with cars uh I mind the car's behavior um and it is very evident to me that the people who are badly behaved uh, need need help to improve. It's not the 95% of people, it's the 5% who, uh, like Nadine says, uh, threaten to kill you, um, which is just not a lot of fun. So perhaps I can have a go at, at that response as well. 
um, and it may have been something I said in an earlier session actually, but just in terms of the design process, I go back to the design process that at this stage, what we're doing is trying to identify the strategic network. And that's not to say that any street that's not on the strategic network is, is, isn't um, a good street or shouldn't be a good street for cycling. Obviously the city has something like 700 kilometers of streets. Um, they are all cyclable um, to, to some degree, unless it's a motorway, in which, in which case you're banned. And obviously, you know, you're banned from riding on footpaths unless it's a designated shared path. Having said that, um, a lot of the level of service or the comfort that uh, people experience when they're using the network um, is, is very poor, particularly as, as vehicle volumes and speeds increase. You know, we all know that. What the strategic network is about is defining those places where we think are making important connections between the city centre and the suburbs. Um, and that's what we're doing at this stage. The next stage, once we've locked in this plan, is then to go to each of those places uh, and work out, in, in turn, because we obviously can't do them all, um, in turn, uh, work out what is the best way of achieving that. In some places, that just might be traffic calming, um, lowering speed limits and doing other things. Um, in other places, um, it, it might be fully separated cycleways. Um, and kind of, as I mentioned before, um, the whole multi multimodal thing. So making sure we're doing the right things for pedestrians and people on bikes and, and people using public transport, um, you know, as well as uh, maintaining good accessibility for, for the people that need to use the cars. All that, all that is in there. Um, but kind of the key point is that we just can't live or continue to live with the current arrangements in all these places because you know they're clearly inadequate something's got to change but that change won't necessarily be easy or, or straightforward or, or even or even fully achievable um in, in the you know in the immediate time frame um but nevertheless that's our mission um lucy just a quick point that we are wanting to adopt some wider um city speed limits, at least some of us are, highly political. We, we're waiting for some changes for government uh, to be made. And then, you know, ideally you'd make some quite sweeping, consistent changes all over the city so that people know what they're supposed to be doing where. So we're just waiting to, to see if that can happen. Um, James. Um, I just sort of like want to go back to an early comment. Um, th there was a comment about it being inconvenient for me to park on Thorndon Quay. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't make that representation due to my own inconvenience, but it was more as a representation of, of businesses that are along that, I, that I've spoken with. Um, with the reduction in parking spaces, that means that, that fewer people are actually visiting these stores based on anecdotal evidence that I've gathered from, from the people along that way. Um, I think that, that Thorndon Quay is a, is a fantastic opportunity because it we do have quite a wide street and quite a, quite a lot to work with, which we don't have in other areas around Wellington. So I'm quite comfortable about something going in there. Um, but I do feel for the businesses that are along there that aren't represented, um, well, particularly in this, in this group. Uh, going back to the cycleway data, I mean, that, that, and the effect on business, that's absolutely relevant. And we, we should have more information about that. I understand the, the some of the practical aspects which make it more difficult until we get those cycleways in place. Um, we're not going to have that data. But the other thing that concerns me is that when we do reach out to other regions, um, whether we're taking a look at congestion charging, whether we're taking a look at cycleways, we do need to make sure that the cycleways in the other cities that we're, that we're looking at are comparable to Wellington. Um, because not all cycleways are created equal and not everybody has the same uh, space constrictions that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Right, is there anything else that um, some of the submitters would like to say? I'm keen to have your feedback. Um, the councillors, any questions? It's super concise, thanks everybody. Yeah, um, actually I'll just ask um, General, um, the Middleton Road that has vexed us a little bit because of the cost, um, so I see that your submission says that it, it should still be prioritised. So do you think just how do we make those prioritisation uh, calls? Do you think we should put some resource into each ward so that, you know, everyone's getting some benefit? Or do you think we just need to make some calls on, on where the volumes are? Well, first, that's the only link that we have for, for cyclists because you can't use the motorway. And so uh, if 
that itself is sufficient. That'll I don't know if it will be, but we cannot encourage people in that in those wards to, to cycle if there's no way. And so uh, I know it might be costly, uh, but uh, if we are if we want to encourage the Tao people's northern ward, then that's the only way to to, to make a cycle way for them. Okay, that was very compelling. Thank you. Okay, no last comments? Claire. Yeah, uh, hi, I was just gonna ask a question to Jane. So I found your um, comments interesting and, and, and thank you for being so uh, candidly upfront about the fact that you're probably gonna be um, a bit in the minority, but I guess what I would say is we have to have a citywide you know, conversation on this and today is part of it. So when you bring anecdotal evidence about the impact on shops, can you appreciate that that's kind of doesn't necessarily help make your case? And I'm just wondering if you, how you would factor in the value of that kind of evidence versus the kind of evidence that our council staff undertake, which is like, surveys and watching and, and not always perfect but I guess yeah I'm just interested in your reflections on that really. Yeah absolutely so I mean the 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 evidence so I, I don't I don't represent the Wellington Chamber of Commerce I'm a member of the Wellington Chamber of Commerce um, and I do hear a lot about what people say um, and and I'm taking that information and and feeding it through because I don't feel that many of those people are in this forum to be able to to put forward that other side of things. Um, it's great that council do go out and get all of the survey information. Um, and I, I suppose the thing is, I'd sort of like turn that around and say, what information has council gone out and gotten from businesses around business turnover? Because I'm here representing a particular, particular point of view and trying to represent a whole lot of other people who aren't here. Um, but then again, it's not really, it's not really my job to I know it sounds really horrible because I should be presenting evidence, um, but like I, it, it kind of it, it kind of goes back to how skewed the research is. If the research is all about what kind of benefits are there to cyclists, but no no research is being conducted by council about the impacts of it uh, um, for businesses. So, you know, I feel that there needs to be more looked at there. I'm I'm not completely opposed to cycle waste, not at all. We 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 all need to live together. We live in a society. We need to be able to share the space and the resources that we have. Um, but I just need to. I just feel that sometimes, well, in in fact, in, in many cases, that the balance that we're striking isn't where I feel it should be. Um, and that's not saying that where I feel it should be is where it should be. Um, but I just yeah, I represent a, a few people, um, a few people's concerns. All right. Well, look, thank you very much. Um, we've come to the end of our session. So again, very valuable um, uh, input and it will be taken on board. Right? It's definitely not a tick box exercise. You know, we need to hear from you. So um, thank you very much. And I hope you have a great afternoon. Oh, thank you. And councillors, so everyone. Councillors, I'll see you back at 1.35. Thanks again, submitters. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Of the council, one of the councillors for Pukehino, Lampton Ward. Right. Um, who would like to start with their piece? Or should I just, Peter? Would you like to? I, I can lead off. Um, okay. So I suppose um, I uh, I run a business, uh, but I'm here as a as a uh, citizen. So my business that I'm a CEO of is on the terrace. Um, so I have an interest in uh, in and have worked uh, in in Wellington for a number of years. I suppose I used to live in Auckland um, and for many years. Um, and I must say we were weird, like most Aucklanders, to our cars. So when we moved to Wellington, uh, we lived in Upper Hutt in Silverstream, and I suppose I experienced the relevation of reconnecting with public transport. So uh, chaos on the roads, and I became a passionately uh, devoted to the efficiency of travelling on a train. Uh, when our kids moved out of uh, 
out of home, we decided to rationalize our tra traveling. And uh, like many people, when you've got sort of empty, empty nests, I suppose, moved into town uh, to uh, minimize the amount of commutes and stuff like that that we used to do. And that was when I reconnected with biking. And I must say our whole family uh, bike now by preference. And I think that's part of the reason why I, I was supportive of the plan. Uh, I won't go through in detail what I put because you've got that, but I suppose um, the, the thing I would like to suggest is that it, is, it was a bit of a mental switch. You're living up on a hill. Uh, in the end, um, uh, you have to get your head around that, the commuting. My wife has bought an e-bike. That means that it's effortless for her. Uh, the other daughter and I, uh, and I use uh, a normal pedal bike, probably because we appreciate uh, the opportunity to get fit. But I think what we've realized is that once uh, you start getting that mental switch, you get what I've called car reluctance. So in fact, you get you get actually aver averse to getting in the car. It's not just um, it's not just the hassle of it and having to park it. And even though I've got a car park provided by Work on Terrace, it's just the fact that it's it's quite frankly it's 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 more time consuming, and, and just much much more efficient. Uh, so much so that our car uh, does not like not being run now and we're continually having to take it in to be serviced for uh, clogged um, uh, emissions control getting that flush because actually the engine is not getting hot enough because we're not regularly using it enough so in some ways we've sort of almost made that switch despite the fact that we haven't got rid of a car and we're certainly not anti-cars so I think that's what uh, you know my personal story uh, and I think there's many others that I would say at our work we've got about 60 people uh, are similar and uh, and and they are and I've seen lots more people cycling in putting pressure on the landlord to provide hooks in the in the garage e-bikes charging points actually e-bikes in our in our premises and I think this is there's some inevitability of this and there's some common recurring patterns once people get into it uh, they find it's not any more enjoyable uh, but healthier so then I come to what's the support of the network and I suppose I I approach this that actually it needs to be there and it needs to be comprehensive uh, because actually we know all of us probably know people that have been hit uh, a board member of mine ended up in a wheelchair for six months in concussion. He ironically was a senior leader at the Ministry of Health. So we joke he had personal experience of the customer journey of a patient, but because of his biking. And I think the key thing is that we know that those, uh, those, those and I've got a mantra uh, message about that. So my, my, my plea to, uh, to the city is I wanna make the city more livable. I think people have, should have options. So the firstly, it should be integrated, You know, support that. Secondly, uh, get it done fast. So you actually drive change rather than sort of incremental and end up, you know, I think we've seen cases of that in, running in, uh, in the Dominion Post around countries that have done it very fast. And I, I've had the luxury of traveling a lot and I've seen that done one year to the next year in a city, there's just dramatic changes, which gives uh, even tourists options. Thirdly, I would say don't infuriate drivers because actually you'll just end up with a, 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 with a bunch of pain. And a classic example of that is, is the, what I perceive as daft proposal to put a, pedest put a pedestrian walkway across Cobham Drive. You know, that's just, it's just daft, um, you know, that proposal that came out. Um, you know, it has to be, that's a, such a thoroughfare and it, and it will provide a red rag to drivers. Um, and then also, perversely, don't let walkers dictate. And the reason and, and the evidence I used to do that was when I was very surprised when I was in Japan some years ago, my wife and I hired bikes to get around Kyoto. And we found everybody was biking on the footpaths, a bit like we do in Oriental Bay. And we were, that's a bit confronting for us uh, as Kiwis. And the Japanese were very... Um, direct about it they said well bike hit by a car really bad bike hits a pedestrian not as bad so why would you not keep the bikes and the pedestrians co-located and away from cars so in some ways the message for that was that actually that's the that's the safest general approach and and i think we've seen that that can be largely successful even though there are some voices from uh, some pedestrians 
that actually they don't like having bikes and pedestrians mixing. So that's um, my story and my pitch to you and uh, encouragement to get on with it. Thank Cheers. you very much. That was really helpful. All right, who would like to go next? I can jump in there, team. Again, uh, George Hickmott here. Um, I've been in Wellington for about eight years and lived in uh, Calderon. I've lived in uh, Oriental, lived in Roseneath, but yeah, as I said, now in Crory. So the reason I got involved in um, this is due to the fact that I bike into work, I come down uh, Birdwood Avenue, then through the Crory Tunnel and into work. Um, and I've also recently, uh, well, we now have a, a 18, 19 month year old daughter and you know she's starting to go to crash in the uh, Calburn areas. Now there are an increasing amount of people, but not many uh, that bring you know their kids into uh, crash, preschool, all these sort of things. Um, so I'm here um, to you know voice the, the opinion of parent um, and also about preschool and school connectivity going forward. Um, given the current state of the nation, there's no, no chance that I would be confident taking my daughter on the back of a bike on the current route that I take mainly because just using the Birdwood F, um, example, um, you know, it's so skinny. Um, there's a shared pedestrian pathway with bikes, which is very unclearly marked. Um, it's so narrow that you can't even share it. Um, and there's a hell of a lot of traffic backed up there. So two things, if there was a fantastic bike route that people could use, there'd be less cars, but secondly, um, it's just so dangerous out there. And I'm sure this is the example elsewhere of, you know, bikes and cars trying to co-mingle um, in these, you know, uh, bottleneck areas. So it's exceptionally dodgy. Um, I too have been hit by a couple of cars, uh, nothing material uh, or anything like that, but you just know that it could happen. Um, the next point I'd like to get to is just around, I suppose, uh, as Peter was noting, that we've got to do this quickly and we've got to do it thoroughly. Um, and I know at some stage, Mark, we're talking to, you know, the fact that we are getting rid of, you know, car parks and, uh, and you know, key business areas. You know, there's the Johnson Bull Business Group. There's also Kilburnie and that sort of thing. And I fully acknowledge that. Um, but I suppose it's a chicken and egg situation. As Peter was saying, like, people might not know exactly how, uh, much biking will be a part of their life, you know, unless it's easy for them to do so. Like using my example, I'm not going to go down that biking route and utilizing these things if the infrastructure is not there. So if we put the infrastructure there, then that might you know, force people's hands to change their uh, lifestyle habits to use a bike instead of a car, you know, but at the moment it's just too hard. So we're never going to get there. So a yeah, bit of a chicken egg situation, but you know, add on top of that, the you know, environmental benefits, um, you know, you look at other cities like um, Amsterdam, you know, cycling is just part of the fabric of the city and you're not going to get that unless you can't do that safely or anything like that. So, yeah, I want to be in a position where I can bike uh, my daughter to school. Um, but at the moment, it, it's just too dodgy. Um, so, yeah, would love, love to see a decent thorough job. Thank you. Um, very helpful uh, to hear from parents. Who's next? Ian, Mark? Uh, I'll go. Um, I'm from Brooklyn and we've got a cycleway installed up Brooklyn Road. It's been there probably about six months. Um, it was installed as a trial and I'm not sure uh, where the progress from that trial has led to because there's been little um, communication about the conclusion of the trial. But having said that, um, the cycleway itself is up Brooklyn Road and Brooklyn is the way for dozens and dozens of trucks to the um, tip at the end of um, Ohio Road. So. Uh, it's very good to have the clear cycleway 
where cyclists can cycle safely up the hill. And it's also been noted by the truck drivers themselves that um, they feel better with the cyclists uh, traveling in their cycleway as opposed to having to share the road, which they do have to do when we come down the hill. So uh, the uphill's um, been sorted, but the downhill also needs to be sorted. But it's a good, it's a great start. It's encouraged more cycling and the cycling figures around Wellington, particularly the measurement around Oriental Bay have shown a big increase in cycling in Wellington. So it's appropriate that um, it, further development is undertaken such as proposed by the cycleway change. And in saying that, by having a look at the opportunities around the bays, uh, the start that's been made so far around Oriental Bay, Evans Bay is great, but it really needs to be continued. And we really need to see um, the full round the bays from Oriental Bay all the way around to Ohio Bay um, developed into a, uh, a safe and encouraging cycleway for everyone to enjoy. Also in the development of cycleways, um, there needs to, I think there needs to be a focus on schools and colleges to encourage um, teenagers to, to cycle to school, to college. And um, so there needs to be a focus there on creating safe cycleways uh, around um, transport to colleges. So I think that's uh, an opportunity that needs to be uh, looked into uh, rather than just the commuting adults to Wellington City. Also, uh, with the development around the bays, there's an opportunity to perhaps to have um, points where people can stop for a drink and some free electricity for their e-bike and um, some free air as well. So there's a little stopping point in Cleveland Street in Brooklyn, but something like that needs to be um, um, positioned around the bays, which would encourage more people to um, enjoy the uh, wonderful city we have and also the, and the opportunity to cycle. And so uh, those are my points. Um, keen to develop the Round the Bay Cycleway and keen to enhance it with um, stopping points for free electricity, air and water. Fantastic, thank you very much. And lastly, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Um, look, my um, uh, immediate concern is really about the proportion of spend according to mode use. Um, and uh, look, I'm not, I'm not anti-cycling in any way at all. Our family cycle regularly, um, but in Johnsville Road, for instance, we've got a, um, a, a dust up between businesses and cyclists. And a lot of the, um, a lot of the plans in place will take away car parks from the businesses there. Um, if I'm a if I'm a tradesperson um, wanting to get my lunch at a bakery on Johnsville Road, if there's nowhere to park, that bakery dies. So it's it's the end of that business. So I just want us to accept that um, supporting cycling does have other damages that we have to account for um, in other ways. So um, look, safety is important, and I would encourage us spending more on cycling on a safety basis, but for Johnsonville, um, our alternative plan takes the cycling away from the main road and puts it onto Moorfield Road. Um, the Moorfield Road option, which we've submitted to council, also directs the cycling towards the school routes. Um, and we've actually got a, a good map of Johnsville showing where those schools are along that route. Um, so for the northern suburbs, and sorry if everyone's from elsewhere in, in Wellington, but for the northern suburbs, which is my immediate concern, um, is really changing the route from Nauranga Gorge over to Nyo Gorge, um, sticking to the 50 kilometre areas versus the 
uh, 80 or 100 K zones. Um, so in summary, um, you know, I'd like to improve cycleways where possible, but I want to divert them from the main routes and choose areas that don't affect uh, such businesses because the, the life of our businesses and, and uh, our jobs um, due to that are uh, at risk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mark, are you related to Chris? Uh, yeah, closely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, a very notable setting. Right, um, okay, well, that was incredibly helpful. Um, Councillors, would do you like to kick off? Are there any comments or questions that you'd like to just start some discussion with? Okay, well, why don't I just ask a quick question? Ian, uh, yes. if you're not a skilled cyclist, is it hard to bike up the Brooklyn Hill? One of our colleagues keeps maintaining it's impossible. Uh, uh not on an e-bike it's quite quite easy on an e-bike and uh with a pedal bike it just takes um it, it is a, a steep incline but the, i think the incline was designed for the transportation of trams in the old days so it's not that steep but um yeah you it, it does take a bit of an effort on a pe pedal bike to uh, go up the hill but it's nice and safe in the cycleway Right, and sorry, just um, Joe, um, the trial, when is it ending? The trial itself uh, phase has ended. The, the uh, matter was reported back to uh, the council um, prior oh, to Christmas. Christ. And, yeah, uh, sorry. and the yep. council has decided that, uh, that, that that will transition to a permanent scheme. So officers are now um, commencing that uh, design process. And uh, sometime later this year, we'll be taking... Um, you know, final proposals back out to the community to consult on those things. Um, and that will in indeed address both improvements to the uh, trial uphill lane, um, as well as um, downhill improvements. Um, and I presume it's been communicated to the community? Well, yeah, the, certainly through the council's website. Um, I don't think, um, and, and through kind of the normal news releases, um, yeah, and obviously that kind of communication will continue, um, you know, when we've got particularly um, more stuff to say. But updates okay. of all that stuff are, are, are on the, available on the website. Okay. Thank you. Right. Anyone else? Well, okay, I'll keep going then. Um, Mark, just um, look, we are we are engaged uh, with businesses and, and all of those issues that we've been talking about, loading zones. Um, have so you think that people would still be able to easily access the shops if they take them more, sorry, because I'm not from Jayville, um, would be, it would still be easy to access all the good community facilities in Johnsonville if they go that way instead of the main road? Yeah, absolutely. Because that's always yeah. the, the main issue. Yep, um, yep, and it's, it's really, uh, I just, where, where possible, I just believe that the cycling should be taken away from the busier roads and put onto the secondary roads. Um, and like I said, it goes past schools and kindergartens and, uh, and it's a slower speed zone for cars as well. And I mean, do you think Johnsonville, though, could be quite transformed? You know, like if they well, when the mall goes ahead, if it was made um, a bit more people friendly, like it could actually be quite a good thing economically. Um, yeah, as long, as long as every mode of transport has its uh, separation and its place. So um, John, Johnsonville was the newest suburb in the history of Wellington, not that I'm a historian, but, um, and so the way that it was designed was, was more based around cars. Um, versus somewhere like um, Newtown or T Tinakori or something like that, which was um, uh, based around, you know, horse and car. So um, it's the, the distance of area, the, the catchment that Johnsonville serves as a suburb is, is a lot larger than most other areas. Um, Churton Park, um, Paparangi, and all of those people that need to go to the bank 
they need to drive, well, not in all cases, but in many cases, they need to drive their car to that service centre. Um, if you live in Newtown, I would suggest that you could probably ride your bike or walk. Um, Johnsville's just a little bit different in my mind. And it's also separated from the city by um, uh, Narawanga Gorge as well, which is, um, you know, may suit some cyclists, but not many. Thank you. Councillors, any questions? Um, all right, sorry, I don't want to, oh, Jenny? Oh, sorry, you're on mute. Yep, sorry. Um, I was just wondering, George, if you could talk to us about like what, what kind of infrastructure or cycling infrastructure would you need to feel confident cycling with your child with you? Because I think that would be useful for us to understand. Yeah, so what would be ideal is if there's a separate bike lane a bike only lane that's not uh what that cars can't be a part of um using the birdwood road as an example there's just a footpath next to the road which is great um you can bike down that but it's only yay wide and it's to be shared with pedestrians as well so if you're then passing somebody on in that regard you are inches from the road sometimes edged onto the road um, and there's only one footpath on one side of the road and nothing on the other side of the road. So um, I know it's very selfish me talking about just this one particular road, but it encapsulates all of the risks associated with why somebody wouldn't be biking down there. Um, so too close. I mean, the, um, the, the, there's no dead cat bike lane only, um, which would be a breeze. Like I would happily bike down that rain, hail or shine. Um, it's just the risk of getting clipped, which again has happened to myself a couple of times. I've just cars been too close proximity um, and you know just kind of being non-aware of the fact that there are bikers around there as well. Um, aside from that, no, that's pretty much it. I mean, we've all got um, helmets and that's pretty much the only other safety concern. Um, yeah. Uh, George, if I may, uh, uh, councillors, um, it's interesting because um, I've often thought about the situation that you're uh, suggesting, that biking each day uh, down I live up in Roseneath, and which obviously where you've lived previously. But there are some uh, local parents that have those uh, bikes that have multiple seats on sequentially in order for their, and, and, and one particular case there's a father with with two very young kids that are on the bike and I must say it surprises me regardless of whether there were cars on the road the speed that some of these uh, parents go with their tiny tiny tots uh, on these on these on these sort of these bikes particularly when they're in, when the kids are in front of them and I've often wondered uh, what the potential for accident is but I think I'm supportive of you in general that actually it is going to be ordinarily much safer if you've got a separate lane. In some areas it may not always be possible. I think that's the tricky thing. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the road I'm talking about, uh, there's not much more real estate there. And I, I completely get that. No. Um, but, you know, if we can encourage more parents to be doing drop-offs via uh, bike, it's just going to free up so much room. And the routes to these crashes and schools are all wiggly and windy roads anyway um so there are more than enough cars there and you're yeah, much like yourself um it would save me time and you know i'd be able to cut through traffic and actually get to work faster if i had a dedicated route but um oh, and I, I think i think that's the balancing act and i think councillors those of you that if, if you've ever been to you know we've there's been mention of um european studies before they have some quite interesting ones because they don't necessarily take them down the main drag which would seem logical point to point but they have uh they have uh, dedicated uh, lanes that go down seemingly around around corners and down back lanes and in between houses almost but actually they're very very efficient because they're only bikes uh, and so, you know, I, I think that complete separation, even if it doesn't seem that you're going down the main high street, um, is how they've managed to get around with a, with a, uh, you know, London in particular, you know, an old, an old infrastructure, an old city, um, and potentially the roads not as wide as one would wish them. So, you know, we have a, we have similar issues here. Of course, we're not, we're not in Vicargo, are we? Welcome back, Terry. Sorry. 
Jenny, sorry, did you have some more questions? I'm happy to go again. If, if yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, uh, just as probably mostly for Mark, but uh, I guess when we're looking at these these kinds of bike routes and other changes to the road, and and we're trying to to preserve parking, and we're going to prioritise the parking that we can keep for for usages. And so I'm just interested, like, so we would probably prioritise the we would prioritise bus stops, loading zones mobility parking, and then short stay, so P5, P10, P30, P60 parking. Does that, as a business owner and, and someone who's, you know, close with our retailer group, does that seem like we've at least got those priorities right? Uh, yes, but when we when we look at the amount of car users in Johnsonville, so there's 55% uh, of uh, people travel from Johnsonville um, to the city by car. 1.5% uh, travel by bike, right? And so over the years, we've lost um, uh, something like 180 car parks down to what might be 40 car parks in Johnsonville. So 55% of the northern suburbs um, service centre has 40 car parks. Um, so that's really where I'm coming from. I'm not trying to stop cycling at all, but it's just a... Uh, a reflection of the numbers of mode users um, and how we how we service all of those uh, users of the space. Um, can I? Oh, Ian. Hi, I just wanted to um, add uh, some observations from the cycleway. Um, that might be factored into your future planning. And that is actually the, the actual users inside the cycleway. So we've, we've got pedal cycles and we've got e-bikes. Well, we find that um, some of the uh, lower powered motor scooters decide that they don't want to contest it with the uh, very large trucks. And they, did, they take to the um, cycle lane themselves and pedal, um, scoot up there on their little scooters. And in addition to that, some people decide it's because there's no uh, footpath on that side, it's a good good um, path to um, stroll down. Um, so walkers are in there. And then we've got um, the other scooters, the, um, the, the flamingos and that style. And so you've got three or four different modes of transport all squeezing into a, a cycleway that's really built for cyclists and e-bikes. So um, that's something that uh, could be, uh, should be factored into the planning is to get the um, clear usage for the right sort of vehicle and, um, and not have it contested with walkers and, um, and motor scooters. So um, that's something to uh, consider that. I guess the motor scooter shouldn't be there. But you feel safe on it at the moment? Well, uh, yeah, generally they, they keep out of one another's way, but it, um, uh, potentially a, a, a motor scooter and a, and a cyclist is a um, competing situation and um, as won't feel the safe for the cyclist. Um, Peter, can I just ask you, do you think um, having good cycling infrastructure and facilities is, is a competitive edge in the kind of business world you're operating in? Um, absolutely. I think, you know, we're, we're based on the terrace um, and we used to be based down on Thorna Key, ironically, before earthquakes. And I, what I would observe uh, when we were down at Thorna Key, a lot of the a team actually drove because they had free car parks that were in sort of Thorn and Key and up the hill towards Wadestown. Um, and when we moved into the the town, obviously, there was an affordability issue around car parks and availability. 
So people had to make a change, really. Most people made a change. Now, I'm lucky enough, uh, being the CEO, had a, had a car park provided as part of my contract, which I've, by the way, relinquished. Um, but the weird thing about it is that that forced change meant that people commuted, and people commuted in a way that you know, arguably is more healthy for them and for everybody else. But actually, uh, the number of people uh, that are driving in sole occupancy cars has dropped in some ways that was a message for me again what i'm bringing here is do, if we do it fast people actually will, will have to adjust um and 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 because actually uh, suddenly they see there's an option and perhaps it's more efficient um and so so yeah so certainly i think Wellington must be a livable place you know like you know having lived in auckland there are lots of attractions in auckland and auckland is getting its if you forgive my French, but it's getting its shit together in some ways. And I think that's a little bit scary for us that are now committed to Wellington. You know, it used to be dysfunctional. It's not now. And it's getting, it's getting more attractive. And there's things that we will lose people to, 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 to Auckland if we don't get our place livable and maximise. And of course, that, you know, you've got an unenviable uh, balancing act here around, you know, trying to do things like this first actually fix sewer pipes and deal with airports and, and you know, roading infrastructure. And I get that. But I think uh, there's a lot of people that, uh, that I mix with, and particularly in the digital sector, where they like the intimacy of Wellington. They like the ability to get around. They like to get there quickly. And actually, once you've, once you've gone on to a bike, uh, it's just so much more efficient. It's just so, so quick by comparison. Literally, it's quicker. Um, and then the e-bikes just transform it even more. Now that's not my choice, but certainly my wife is in a dress, and you know she's a, also runs a she's CEO of a business. She runs she bikes in her work clothes, you know. So so I think that that sort of um, and again there's the helmet head argument, a helmet hair I should say, um, but but you know that's not really up to the Wellington City Council to solve that. But yeah, no, I think we have to have some sort of competitive edge. Uh, in Auckland, the, 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 as you've probably seen, there's been a lot of biking infrastructure put in, the most northwestern motorway, which is where I used to live out in Titarangi. Um, there's virtually no one using it. Why? Because Auckland commuters don't go where the bike commutes go. You know, they go across town often, where they work and where they live. Um, and they haven't got into the habit. I think genuinely the way that New Wellington is structured as a, as, a, as a sort of a CBD focused uh, where people work and network and play, we've got a real opportunity to do something smart and, and, and drive that change that we all want. And I don't yeah, want that's to a good call. That is, a, is a, a fair call, Peter. Like um, when you think of Wellington, you think of it as a switched on progressive uh, city. Yet if we don't have this pretty... Um, well, it's a no-brainer, you know. It seems to be the next progressive step in being a clean, green, efficient, cool, hip city. So, like, if we miss this opportunity, then we're going to lose that that image. Yeah. And I think also the distances aren't large, George. You know, like, having coming, you know, I my commute was Titarangi to Ponsonby, and my wife's was Titarangi to Manukau City. You know, that's a long haul on a bike, even on an e-bike. You know, we have the ability with a lot of us have a reasonably short uh, commutes. Um, and I appreciate as a business person the, the issues that uh, Mark was talking about before, because obviously there's a balancing act there. Um, but, um, but I think we need to get on and do this. And the two of you, to the businesses that might not be part of the digital kind of hip whatever scene, the people that you know like are doing some of the I don't know the plumbers and the and the food delivery which is you know like fundamental to a functioning city who are expressing sometimes concerns around losing parking do you have a response to that I think you were talking about land lo loading bays anyway weren't you, you know, oh I'm very obsessed with them now <laughs> yeah you know like I think loading bays are essential clearly and and you know certainly my um you know I've uh <clears throat> seemingly, and you'll probably find uh, be, be, uh, buried in the bowels of the Wellington City Council archives, uh, a running battle I had with Wellington combined cabs, because we have, uh, my particular uh, organisation on the terrace has a lot of courier traffic, you know, we, we, we're we uh, just 
briefly, we're a, uh, we're a digital business, but we, we sit in between food and, and manufacturers and the supermarkets. So we do a whole lot of work. We receive product before, all product before it goes to, on the shelves, and we do lots of things with it. And so we have a lot of physical deliveries, and, uh, and, and the loading bays are always full of bloody taxis. Uh, you know, and, and, and Wellington, Wellington combined just flagrantly just ignores the problem and uh, they just b block up the entire uh, side above James Cook. So that's a different issue. So courier drivers genu genuinely will be frustrated, but actually it's not, it's not people working. It's, it's, it's uh, taxis in that particular case from one company, mm. not green okay. cabs. Okay, okay. Um, Councillors, have you got any more questions of clarification? Comments? Yeah, I was just going to ask Ian, um, thanks for your comments about the Brooklyn Hill. And I know you were talking about a cycleway the other way. What, uh, you did touch on it, but what were you thinking in terms of the, um, the configuration of that or what do you think would work best? Well, I, I think um, there's a particular pinch point at the bottom of um, outside Central Park with that walkway. And um, as I say, there's a large number of large trucks coming up and down the Brooklyn Hill. And uh, you do compete for space when you get on the downhill run. And um, that that needs to be factored in because um, it is discouraging for cyclists have, having to um, go down the hill and compete with these very large trucks and also the ordinary cars that are traveling traveling there as well so it's um it's it's quite a uh, congested space and the the way around it is for the cyclists to um travel down at the same speed as cars as 50k and and take up a, a space in the middle of the road as opposed to keeping to the uh, left hand side Yeah, it seems like we'll need something creative there, but plenty of space, unlike many places. Thank you. Yes. Mm. You um, asked before around um, my perspective on uh, the business, um, like Mark, Mark's predicament there, and I'm fully supportive of, you know, alternative routes around those main street areas for the reason being that, um, in my experience, when you're biking through like bike paths in those very, very congested areas, it actually does become quite crazy with cars, bikes, scooters, people, everything that, you know, like my preference would be if I am bypassing, you know, a busy area like that. Yeah, scooting around the side, like Peter said, you know, in these back alleyways, I don't necessarily have to be through, you know, the main vein of the city. That's helpful. We saw that on Riddiford Street yesterday where there was a delivery vehicle, a big bus, and two Wellington East students trying to get by on their bus, uh, their bike. Sorry, it was, yeah, it was a bit tricky. Um, Mark, sorry, can I just ask, um, in terms of engagement with the council, what's been happening? Uh, you can. So we had a um, community meeting on the 2nd. Um, and that was the Johnsville Community Association and the Johnsville Business Group. Um, probably because it was business group involvement, um, it, was, it was pretty focused on saving car parks rather than promoting cycleways. Um, uh, however, there's, you know, there was a balance at the meeting too. Um, uh, so look, we're a pretty motivated community. community. I, think, I think for Johnsville's case, we're trying to separate ourselves from um, other cycleway decisions because we feel that we are a metropolitan centre and we want to protect our, um, our CBD in respect of its business interests. Um, and like I say, that was my motivation to move the bike path off the main road and, and find a quieter route. Um, I was quite impressed, Peter, with um, your comments about in European cities about how the cycleways are often in back street um, uh, alleys and things. And and I think um, you know there was there was a a suggestion a while ago for Thornling Key, where 
a cycle and bus route could have been put on the edge of the railway grounds. Um, so um, um, Paul Robertson, uh, Robinson and a few others were trying to promote this. And so that would have taken cycling right away from the cars and they would have just had a direct route straight to the city. Um, but of course, um, you know, the railway had to get involved and it was all a bit too tricky. But I think where possible, I think that's, um, those alternatives should be sought. Well, and in fact, uh, um, Mark, uh, uh, Paul Robinson is my landlord and that's why the connection between being on Thorn and Key and on the, on the terrace. <laughs> so, so yes, he's very progressive uh, around that, but also pretty logical businessman really. And I think he was trying to preserve the retail frontage in the car parks, but actually encourage biking. He was one of the, you know, he encouraged biking very, very early as a landlord down in the wall store design center. Yeah. Right, is there anything else or would people like to get back to their busy day? No, thank you very much for the opportunity to be heard, everybody. No, no, it was, that was incredibly useful. Thank you so much. And we, we learn every time we, we listen to what your needs are. Um, and obviously, um, Mark, there might need to be some more uh, discussion with your ward councillor and, um, and others of us as well, too, as we progress. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, thank you very much, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Bye. guys. And councillors, I will see you back at one... Oh no, two forty. Sorry, thank you very much. Two forty. Yep. Thank you. A warm welcome to this session today. Um, so basically, we just start off by introducing ourselves and then tagging the next person, and then we'll get them to listen to what you have to say. So, um, Councillor O'Neill, do you want to start this time? Um, my name is Councillor Terry O'Neill and I represent Te Mutu Kairangi and the eastern, which is the eastern suburbs. Right? And I will tag Luke. Kia ora um, My name is Luke and I have been working with different spokes um, and other groups as part of the, uh, the consultations in December. Lovely to meet you all. Kia ora, I'm Fleur Fitzsimons, councillor for the Southern Pai Kawakawa Ward, and I'll hand over to Jenny. Kia ora, I'm councillor Jenny Condi from Takapu Northern Ward, and I'll hand over to Katie. Kia ora, I'm Katie, I um, live in Kandala, I work remotely and I love to cycle. I will hand over to James. Yeah, hi everyone, uh, I'm James Robertson, I live in Brooklyn. Uh, I don't represent anyone except myself, um, but I cycle Wellington a lot. Uh, so I commute and I mountain bike, and sometimes I even road ride. So, uh, and I made a submission to the online um, the bike network plan, um, mostly just based around my observations. Oh, sorry, I'll pass it on to Lachlan. Kia ora, I'm Lachlan. Uh, I'm a resident of Karori. Um, I do bike to work and everything. So, yeah, pleased to be here. I'll pass it on to my local councillor, Simon. Thanks, Lachlan. Um, kia ora, everyone. Uh, I'm Simon Wolf. I'm a Whārangi Onslow Western councillor, and I'm absolutely welcome to you all. Look forward to hearing the discussions. And um, I think, um, Joe, maybe you should go. G'day, Joe Hewitt. Uh, I'm an advisor to the council on uh, the Bike Network Plan. Who else we got left? Maybe and Emily. I'm Heidi Mueller and I'm a senior democracy advisor here at council. Thanks for all your patience while I've organised this um, forum. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, I'm Emily. I'm a democracy advisor as well. I'm um, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Kia ora. And kia ora. Uh, I own a panet, um, a pukekino, um, Nimpton Ward Councillor. Right. Okay. So who wants to go first? Just maybe about five minutes, and then um, after everyone's um, had a go, we'll have a good conversation. I'm happy to go first. Great, thanks. Uh, so, recognising that my comments are from my own point of view, which is as a you know cyclist commuter for all of my life, pretty much. So, um, you know, I'm very happy to cycle through traffic, and I'm very happy with hills and uh, getting around the streets of Wellington in general. 
Um, so one of the things, I guess my main observation around recent changes, uh, the introduction of cycle lanes, et cetera, you know, in Island Bay and up Brooklyn Hill and around Point Jerningham is uh, I, don't, I don't appreciate the mingling of cycles with pedestrians. Uh, I don't appreciate cars parked on the wrong side of me uh, and car doors opening um, and all the up and down pavements and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I, I really think that cyclists should be treated as first class road users um, and not made to mingle with pedestrians, etc. Um, so as an example, I sometimes go for a lunchtime ride round Point Jerningham. And with the recent changes there, I notice that we're often in contention with pedestrians, runners, um, even other cyclists uh, who are now riding on the same cycle lane um, rather than the other side of the road. Um, and we're riding, you know, 40 kilometres an hour or maybe even 50 as a tailwind and the pedestrians clearly aren't. So it, it's quite a hazardous situation for both parties. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, that uh, frustrates me is, is buses. So having to cycle on the left-hand side of buses with passengers coming in and out uh, seems like a real retrograde move to me. Um, and again, presents a danger to both the cyclists and the bus passengers. So other than that, you know, great. More cycle lanes are excellent. Um, Recognising that Wellington's a very difficult city, uh, lots of hills, lots of tight roads and windy corners, etc. So, you know, my feeling would be focus on new builds, new areas, um, uh, you know, where there are new subdivisions going in, make sure the roads are nice and wide. Um, but when it comes to lovely wide roads, they're already great for cycling on, um, like Island Bay. I hesitate to bring up Island Bay because I know it's <laughs> very contentious. But, you know, in my view, the Island Bay Parade was great for cycling before anything was done. It was a very wide road, lots of space, nice and safe. Um, and slow zones through the shops already. Uh, so that that sort of thing uh, is retrograde to cyclists of my sort. And that's that's probably the crux of what I had to say. Sounds like very succinct, thank you. Who would like to go next? I can go next. Um, sure. Yeah, so I strongly support um, this bike network plan. I think it's long overdue. Um, I biked, I, but my bike is my main mode of transport. Um, I find it very enjoyable. I like the exercise. I like the flexibility. I uh, don't want to have a big car to worry about. Um, and also I feel, um, you know, biking so much more efficient, both in regards to road space and emissions. And a lot, I think a lot of us already know that. Um, and it's so crucial um, for many our climate goals and enabling people to get around in a growing city because um, we can't we'll run out of space in our roads if we all have to, um, the growing population all still needs to drive. Um, yeah, and I think it's also really um, important that kids are able to like bike to school safely because um, that's something that seems to not be as common as it, as, or at least as we like it to be. Um, and I think, you know, there's a real sense of independence when you're young, um, being able to bike, go see your friends, go to the shops, whatever, um, without having to share, try and share a road with um, fast and dangerous cars. Um, so I think this plan's great, really. Um, it'd be a much better experience for pedestrians, drivers, and bikers. Um, I think the only consideration I'd make on that is um, to try and ensure that there is like more mobility parks around areas where we do have to reallocate road space um, from cars to um, new bike lanes. Um, yeah, I've had a number of close scrapes on my rides, um, especially especially at the Ra Roa um, Shader Street intersection in Crory. That one's a nasty one. I nearly got T-bone there the other month. It was not ideal. Um, so um, yeah, I think safety is really overdue for people to feel safe um, riding on our streets. Um, you know, I'm a little bit stubborn anyway. I mean, you shouldn't have to be. Um, so yeah, I'd also like to see um, further than the bike network themselves, the bike lanes themselves, to actually go a bit further and think about how we can slow down the roads around them and maybe use the same kind of transitional principles to try and get speed calming and traffic calming measures on those kind of, I guess, feeder streets. Um, yeah, but I'm looking forward to this bike network getting done. Um, yeah, that's me. Great, thank you very much. Right, Katie, Luke. I can go next. Um, yeah, I just want to start by saying I've, I'm relatively new to Wellington. I've just been here for uh, just over a year. 
And arriving here from Denmark, I was a little bit underwhelmed by the cycle infrastructure that was in Wellington compared to what I was used to. But I have to say that even just within like the 14 months or whatever, like I've seen a lot of progress and I'm just also want to say that I'm really grateful for that. So things like improving the, the parking on Thorndon Quay um, and, you know, Brooklyn, all these like changes and progress are being made. It feels like there's some momentum. So I really hope we can keep that going. And I, I feel like I've arrived at the, at the right time for Wellington in terms of cycling. So I'm just yeah grateful for that too. Um, as regards to the plan, um, yeah, I think completely agree with Lachlan that like safety improvements should be um, prioritized and we shouldn't wait around too long to make the safety improvements that need to be done, especially on some of these scary junctions. Um, I live uh, on Onslow Road and getting down to Hut Road as a cyclist and as, and as a pedestrian is not great. Um, and I hope that we won't have to wait to get the, the full stages of, um, of the plan implemented before we can do things like improving these junctions where um, it feels like there's there's a genuine risk to people especially as we do see an increase in the number of cyclists and people choosing active transport so we can all feel safe to do so and then join up to this lovely network um, i'm really looking forward to trying out the interim measures as they get rolled out as well and giving feedback so i'm glad that we're adopting that approach to to get going really quickly uh, rather than waiting too long um, and yep, super agree with James on shared space. It's it's not great for anyone to to try and mix pedestrians and cyclists. It's it's definitely not fun for pedestrians and uh, for cyclists. It can be um, yeah, it's it's an extra cause of stress and worry when we're all trying to enjoy our journeys um, or just have a nice time in the environment that we're in. So things like um, trying to get along behind the waterfront if we had a proper cycle route there instead of having to to be as it currently is along the waterfront um it seems like it's something that's missing from the plan to make that connection um along chavoy's key or whatever it needs to be uh to to actually separate us from pedestrians so everyone can feel good um and yeah i just want to say please don't i, I read a few submissions today from other people and i noticed like uh, points being raised around uh people saying that we don't need cycle infrastructure on this street or that street because no one currently cycles on them. And I hope you're not going to be swayed by any of those arguments because, of course, the whole point here is to get people cycling or choosing other forms of active transport. So, yes, I'm sure there are roads where there are very few cyclists now that could be transformed if we get this plan implemented as it is now. Um, but yeah, I, I just have to say that a well-connected cycle network, um, it makes me feel considered, it makes me feel safe. Um, it makes me feel like I'm empowered to make the just the general everyday journeys that I need to make on my bike, um, you know, going to get groceries, going to visit friends, whatever it is, um, just in a way that's good for my health, good for everyone's health, um, but also, you know, bike lanes are climate action, and we're doing our bit to, to reach those emissions targets that we have in support of uh, having declared a climate emergency. So this really feels like the right way to go, and I'm excited to see it all get rolled out. And that's it. Sorry, Luke, thank you very much, Katie. All right. Um, yeah, so I agree with a lot of what um, people have said so far and definitely share the excitement that a lot of people share with um, such an awesome expansion of Wellington's uh, cycle network, uh, because I think it's really important to make it as easy and safe as possible for people to ride bicycles in and around the city um, and safe separation between cars, bikes and pedestrians. Um, something that I would just like to talk about as well is um, low traffic neighbourhoods as well. Um, just trying to make it easier for people to cycle in, internally within their um, their neighbourhoods as well um, and turning making it a nice 30 um, or, or something along that line, speed limit um, for people does just make it a lot easier, as James pointed out when it came to Island Bay. Um, and I also think that we should be really keeping in mind uh, mobility and accessibility issues. As Lachlan pointed out, you know, um, mobility parking is really important. I actually had, on another note, I actually had a really nice chat to someone who um, has both vision and uh, mobility, disabilities, and he takes the um, bus quite often to work from Minima. 
And he was saying that um, actually an expansion of the cycle network would be really good for him because he doesn't really like taking the bus that much. It can be quite difficult to use and for, for reasons he enumerated on. But um, I just think that um, expanding this and making it easier is, is going to be really awesome for every, all well, Wellingtonians, hopefully, to get around. Um, and... I also want to talk about uh, the rainbow community in Wellington. So there's a strong rainbow uh, bike riding community in Wellington and many that um, would want to start riding will ride much more often and uh, a well-connected bike network would really help. Um, but also we really want to think about how it's going to be inclusive as well for people in the rainbow community, um, especially keeping in mind safety. Um, as we know, LGBTQI uh, people um, do are at high risk from um, assault and um, bullying. And so I think keeping in mind crime prevention designs is really, really key as well. Um, and making sure there's plenty of lighting, visibility, um, especially in the more isolated and bushy areas is really key. Um, and then also something that was talked about in the Rainbow Hui a couple of, well, actually a couple of months ago now, um, was uh, querying public spaces. And I think when it comes to bike networks and um, anything that can be done to make it more welcoming and easier for people in the rainbow community would be awesome. And yeah, uh, I guess that's it. <laughs> I'm also very excited. And I think that if we, if we are really thoughtful and mindful um, when we make this, it could be really exciting and awesome for Wellington. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, right. Um, participants, is there anything that you would like to ask of each other? Um, any additional points? I'm sure councillors will have questions. I've got quite a lot, but um, you go first. I wanted to start by apologising for just um, bringing up all my complaints to start with. I think the bike, bike network is a great idea and I'd love to see more people cycling around Wellington safely. Um, and yeah, climate action, great. Um, so yeah, apologies for that. No need to apologise, it's all good. Um, all right, I'll start just to, um, Joe. can we do anything about Chatel Street? I know I'm very aware that it is problematic or does this need a big solution? Can I come in there please, um, Iona? Because there, there, is, there is something happening there. The, the, you know, oh, okay, good. Not, not, not just in relation to the, um, um, the bike side of things because we, we're aware of the dangers of it but um, again um, Councillor Cowett's been leading the charge in this area and um, it relates to um, a different form of engineering around that that area especially the Rara Road entrance and exit um, and it's um, in the hands of um, our engineers and also let's get Wally moving so it, it, it's happening it'll just take a little while. Okay. Yeah I don't have anything to add to that thank you Councillor. Okay. That's helpful. Thanks. Jenny. Thank you. Um, I want to start off with a question about, thanks Luke for raising the issue around safety. Um, in a few of our sessions today, we've had suggestions about um, cycleways not going onto main roads where there's a lot of competition for other traffic and parking and whatnot. And I guess I would just be interested in your views on some of those ideas from a safety point of view um, and whether you would have any concerns about about that. And of course, anyone else who might want to comment who's here. Sorry, is this to me directly or? Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, I think the big, the, one of the key things is um, uh, separation of some kind is really important. Like obviously not a massive concrete wall, but something that makes it really clear um, that, you know, that in, in some of the temporary ones I've seen, um, they've had some kind of separation, you know, whether it be the, I don't know the technical name for them, but, um, and making sure that there's really clear signage too, that the little cycle sign is between driveways as well is really important, um, and between bus stops. I can't think of too much more else because, um, yeah, I don't know anything 
else off the top of my head, but if anyone's got some other points, I'm sure there's much more to add on that one. Yeah. I, I guess I was thinking more like, thank you for that, and it's the separation is such an important issue, but I was thinking about safety in terms of um, personal safety rather than safety as a cyclist. And, you know, these um, with the competition on main roads for parking and other things, there's been suggestions, oh, can we put them down little laneways or can we have them kind of go on quieter roads that are around the back? Um, and, and would you be comfortable with that from a personal safety point of view? And I guess, you know, Katie, as a woman, you could you could come on on that as well, about the, the concerns just about being, you were raising issues about lighting and passive surveillance and those sorts of things. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I definitely think that if, if they're going to be going off main roads, that is something really key to be thinking about. Because um, I think a lot of people would feel quite uncomfortable with tunnels and that sort of thing. Um, or it can be a risk um, and yeah but 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 um yeah I don't I don't know too much about about that uh, that debate whether it's better to keep it on the road or not um, sorry but that's all I can think of off the top of my head I think um jumping on that one um like you also don't like you know what I don't want to end up going on like too much of like a detour with these side roads or going through too many intersections and um, just to stay off the main roads um, and there's some places where it's convenient like um, going down Tasman Street to get around the basin um, and skip a lot of that um, Newtown traffic especially when heading into Newtown um, from that end um, but yeah you also, I also wouldn't want to see it become more indirect and uh, more turns and intersections and if if you could just have the safe separated route on those main roads. I'd be quite comfortable with that, personally. Yeah, me too. Um, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, no. I was just building on the question. Uh, yes, I agree with Lockton that I would certainly, um, I'd be happy with the separation. That's what I'm used to in Denmark on any kind of, of roads is having that fully separated cycle lane, even if there's trucks and buses going past, especially with proper sequencing at junctions so that uh, so the cyclists can get ahead of the, of the traffic as well as pedestrians. So I think that should help. And I also want cyclists to be visible so that other people will start cycling. And um, I think seeing vulnerable road users might also encourage safer behavior in, in other users of the space as well, maybe. Can I just say, you know, as a fast middle-aged white guy, uh, the only place I've ever felt personally unsafe is riding through Central Park at night. <laughs> But that's bad for everyone. Terry. Oh, I just had a question about cyclist behaviour. It feels like we're all kind of preaching to the converter here, which is excellent because then we can kind of delve into the more nuance. Um, yeah, Luke, you spoke a little bit about the different spokes perspective. Um, and anybody else feel free to jump in. I guess just any sort of different behaviours um, myself as not a very confident road user, I would only go out cycling um, with friends or having wider shared path type things means that I can go out with my mates who are on different sets of wheels to me. So um, those two as examples, but what does a completed bike network look for yourselves? And any of you have children or nieces and nephews that you cycle with, what kind of things do you check out before you plan a route to go somewhere? I'm interested to or do you mostly do for recreation or um yeah I'm interested in bringing that up is that again directed to me and then to what? other people anybody <laughs> anybody opening up the accessibility you know yeah I think I can say that just since we've been in uh the red uh alert level traffic light level um, I've, I stopped using public transport while I was waiting to get a booster. Um, so that's forced me to make more journeys by bike. And I've had to think more about the routes that I would take because there was probably only one or two uh, routes that I felt I knew really well and was used to. Um, and yeah, it certainly has got me on streets that I'm not used to being on, on my bike and being aware of you know more challenges at intersections and these kinds of things. And um, I, I guess the ideal would be with a fully 
uh, connected bike network that I wouldn't need to think too much about the route that I was going to take or, you know, where, where there would be cycle parking or anywhere that was a bit of a pinch point. I could just get on my bike and then see where the day takes me. Um, but yeah, certainly at the moment, I, I do try and stick to some of the existing cycle infrastructure as much as possible. Like I said, I live on Onslow Road, but I've never once cycled up Onslow Road because I feel like, I mean, it's I'm going to be slow and I don't feel that I'm comfortable in, in the traffic as it is now to be that slow person getting in the way of cars and buses, etc. cetera. Um, so when I'm on my bike, I'm generally going downhill to where it's a bit flatter and these things. So I think a network where I feel um, I think like what's been um, trialed at Brooklyn where you feel safe going slow um, is also really good, especially I think for people who are cycling with children or with cargo bikes with lots of loads, which we're going to see more of as well. Um, so yeah, that's those are my thoughts on it. Yeah, I, I, oh, sorry, Did, was someone else going to speak? You go. Okay. Um, yeah, that's actually a really good point. And I'm also, as well as you, Terry, I'm not a very confident cyclist and I think uh, I, I definitely stick to the ones that I know and the ones that are really well signed out because the thing I'm always terrified about is having a car right right up behind me honking at me or saying get off the road or something along those lines um, and definitely again going back to the low traffic neighborhoods I think that's really key as well because it's quite nerve-wracking to be in a 50 um, especially if you're trying to go up a hill or something like that and you've got cars around you um, so definitely uh, signage, really key, um, enough space as well for people to pass if need be and feeling comfortable for different people uh, of different abilities to, to cycle. Thank you. And um, I'd just like to welcome Mark Johnston. How are you, Mark? Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. I just uh, had a work meeting slightly in the calendar until three, so um, sorry, mate, everybody. No, I completely understand. Um, are you able just to turn up your volume a bit? Do you, it's just quite faint. Let's see if I can move the mic a bit closer. Oh, okay, that's good. Um, we, we just invited people just to talk for five minutes. We're just into questions and discussion at the moment, but do you want to just take five minutes just to share your views on the plan? Uh, oh, no, it's okay. I don't mind joining the Q&A. That's okay. There's not okay. much time left, so that's okay. I've got some time. Terry, you've got some more questions? Um, now, could I, oh, sorry, Fleur. I took my hand down. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask, and I asked the earlier group this as well. I just, um, I'm interested in whether you think that we've done, we sort of, we've got residents with us on bike lanes being a key tool to reduce emissions in Wellington, and what you think the council could do in that, in that particular area to get that message through a bit more because I feel like it's um it's well understood by people who kind of live and breathe this stuff but other people probably don't quite grasp the significance of it in a in a climate emergency so I just I'm interested you uh, this group happens to be all pretty much uh, on the same page so you're probably a good group to ask um for perspectives on that given you interact with Wellingtonians who aren't um you know so familiar with these issues So maybe James, because I saw you nod. Yeah, I'm just trying to think, because <laughs> most of my friends are cyclists as well and greenies, so they all, they all get it already. I mean, I know that most Wellingtonians would understand, and uh, from a logical point of view, the, the positive impact uh, that cycling would have. But as soon as it starts to impact their neighbourhood and their parking and the route that they're used to taking, I think they just forget about all that stuff and they're just like, well, this is frustrating for me. Um, yeah, I'm talking about car, car drivers primarily. So, uh, yeah, I don't don't have any real insights on how to improve that, sorry. Anyone else? Um, I was just thinking that um, it's sometimes we see a response as though um, by investing in cycle infrastructure, we're also somehow coming for people's cars and that people aren't going to be allowed to have cars anymore in this kind of extreme version um, of what's going on. So I don't know if there's anything we can do to reassure people that when we're not looking to take away people's private cars and like the journeys they need to make by car, they'll still be able to make by car. Um, yeah, I don't know. It seems like a worry that people have and because it's, it's you know, quite far away from what the reality is going to be, 
even if we do implement like the world's best uh, public transport situation or cycle infrastructure. Um, so yeah, I don't know if there are opportunities there for reinsurances. Um, I can't, so if someone has the numbers on this, I just tried to look at it before, but as far as I recall, the, the votes for the cycle network plan that increased were quite, it was pretty clear that it was, uh, most people were in favour of it. If I'm right, I think it was close to 70% or perhaps more. Maybe not around the council table, Luke. <laughs> but definitely, definitely around the public. I think it was close with council. But yeah, because yeah, um, my impression sometimes is that uh, it's a vocal minority of people who get up in arms about it. But most people, I mean, especially when it comes to parents and families, I mean, the idea of you know taking your kids around the neighbourhood is awesome for a lot of people. Um, I guess part of it is just um, like communicating that this is about transport choice, not forcing you to take a bike. Um, you'll still be able to drive around everywhere. Um, and also emphasizing like people who ride bikes often also drive cars and people who drive cars also walk places and bike sometimes. And yeah, and also I think for families, it's be great for your kids to be able to just go out and bike somewhere without you having to get in the car and drive them there, right? So um, I always like doing that as a kid. Um, biking around the place to get places so yeah if I could just respond to that um part I think as council and in my community in the eastern suburbs there is a lot of organizing from the business districts and um people that want to maintain their private right over um a publicly owned car car parking spaces so um, unfortunately, that looks like you know, A3 ads in the newspapers and stuff like stuff we, we could never really afford or, or making an assumption that uh, cycling groups can afford. Um, but that has been probably a bit of a barrier. And I also, um, talking only from my own personal experience, but I've experienced um, you know, some really kind you know, businesses that want to be able to embrace the climate and their people. Um, that have been scaremongered and lobbied really hard by um, other, you know, operators in the area that rely on car parks for their businesses, which, you know, there's um, conflicting evidence and studies, I guess, to talk about um, the use of car parks um, and how that supports business. But to address your question. Uh can everyone hear me okay i just yeah i just wanted to follow up on that um that point because I, I read some of the feedback from some of the businesses affected in maybe miramar um uh, and it seems to suggest that you know that there's on, only people only shop by by car and it's because people can only really imagine the current status quo continuing and they can't it's difficult for people to imagine something that's that's sort of alien to them at the moment so that's where you know awesome projects like this um, this new tactical urbanism project to go from Newtown into um, into the waterfront. Uh, once it's on the street, people will be able to visualise people using it, and they might even, if they're on the fence, they might even say, "Hey, I'm going to give this 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 a go," and you know what, I pick up some things from the shop on the way home. So yeah, all of a sudden you've got um, got people shopping in say supermarkets on on bikes uh, it's, it's definitely something i used to be the weirdo sort of seven years ago with the one guy on the bike with you know, the shopping um me and maybe some other bike mechanic friends but um yeah, now it's it's kind of frustrating finding a park uh, for a bike outside some shops um so yeah uh, it's a good good problem to have um uh, but yeah i think keep it up with the um i think i read katie's submission on this uh, actually as a bit of prep and i think um katie mentioned low traffic neighborhoods uh i don't know if they've been talked about but that that's a really good way of, of getting this started because that it doesn't affect people enormously uh and in some cases it can sort of um improve the streetscape for them they they can sort of kids can play in the street a bit more safely if there's not cars racing through uh and, and then they might choose to say bike down to the local dairy instead of instead of driving there um you know that kind of thing so it's just it, it it's it is always difficult to flip from this um what we've currently got to imagining a future where things might be different but um 
uh, you're doing well so far, but I think the tactical urbanism is going to help a lot, and we'll reach this sort of critical mass of um, of cycleways where um, more and more people are getting on board, and and it's starting to happen already. Like the the support for it is growing around the city. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, from my personal experience, I'm like I'm far more pop down to the shops on my bike than I would otherwise if I was just going for a walk or getting a car sorted it's just so much more convenient for that in 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 the same suburb quick trips um so i'm always popping down to the op shops in glory and supermarket yeah um katie could i just ask you just given you come from denmark we have spent a lot of time talking about denmark um and in fact i've just read a great book about happiness in denmark um, <laughs> um so I think people are kind because of, we are behind, we're kind of at, at a time where we're starting the transformation. In Denmark, do you think the transformation is complete? Or can you remember a time when a lot of a lot of people weren't biking? And then the investment has been made and now it's changed? Um, well, I only lived in Denmark for six years, um, but I was living in, in Aarhus, which is the second largest city. And um, even in, in that time, there were still improvements being made. Um, I think in the 90s, there was a big move towards pedestrianizing large areas of the city and reopening covered waterways and some of the things that I'd get, you know, I hear being talked about for places like Wellington now, um, which suddenly opened up the entire city center for uh, active transport, essentially. But there's, there's still cars in the center, but what they've done is, is yeah, institute these kind of low traffic neighborhood techniques so they're very very low speed limits cars are supposed to be seen as guests on those streets rather than necessarily having right of way or anything like that and there'll, there'll still be conflicts occasionally but it's more likely to be with people who are um, sitting outside a cafe that's spread quite far out onto onto the kind of pedestrianized area with your bike more than it's going to be getting getting jammed from the cars the trickiest thing i think has been delivery vehicles um, because there's lots of narrow streets and delivery vehicles still need to be allowed to, to get to the businesses. And that's that's something that I don't know if anyone's really solved perfectly yet, but I guess it's around time of access. But certainly um, there's been a lot of uh, focus on cycle infrastructure, I think particularly in Copenhagen, just because it's, it's so popular that some junctions are so busy with cyclists that there's not enough space. So they're having to come up with other routes and bridges, et cetera, to kind of spread the cyclists out. Um, and I think that if we get to that point, that would be a really nice situation to be in. Um, but no, I mean, it's very steady. I mean, taxation is different in Denmark. So there's just generally more money to spend on these kinds of things. And they're very, very well maintained. I think that's super important with this network that we maintain it properly. Um, you know, if there's snow, the cycle lanes are cleared before, like the roads are cleared and same with the pavement so that everyone who's uh, getting around via active transport can do so safely and just generally keeping those like, those uh, cycleways clear of debris and anything else that builds up over time as as does happen is super important. So I hope that we also have the infrastructure in place to to maintain these once they're up and running, because um, that's that's key as well. But yeah, I'd say that. That funding is a difference that I think is going to be a big challenge for us. But I hope that we can make it work. Thank you. James? Can I, yeah, just add a point there? So even outside of um, cycle networks per se, because there's still going to be a lot of roads that we ride around in Wellington that don't have cycle lanes, uh, number one best thing you could do for me would be keep the, keep the road margins clear. So make sure it's good seal, no bad repairs, no potholes, no you know detritus swept into it after there's been a crash. Um, you know, move the manhole covers away and the bad drainage grates and all that stuff. Um, there's there's a lot of streets around Wellington that are pretty bad to cycle on just because of that. If if the road margins were good, um, there'd be much more pleasant and safe experience. That's fantastic. Um, and then Luke, I just had a question for you. So thank you for speaking on um, behalf of different spokes because um, I, just now I think maybe we need to do something with our bike plan to talk about how we are supporting different groups of people who might have different barriers or different opportunities or whatever. Um, can you just, and I did go to the meeting, but are you able just to talk a little bit more about how we could um, make the bike network more accessible for rainbow communities? Yeah, um, uh, thanks for that question. That's really important. Um, 
I've heard from people in different spokes that there are some individuals who are really keen to get cycling but don't currently feel safe, um, which again, as to the going back to the points that I mentioned, is totally reasonable and fair. Um, what people were talking about basically in the hui um, that we had when talking about some of these issues were the two main things were thinking about how to queer these public spaces so that it feels like it's something that people in the queer community are a part of instead of just sort of invited along um, and making sure that that's really clear and obvious. I mean, simple things like um, the rainbow crossing at Cuba Street. I mean, it, it might just seem like a empty token, but it's really important for a lot of people. It shows that they're valued and respected in the community um, and that they have a really important place there. So I think things like that is, you know, that's really awesome and that could make a huge difference. And the other thing that um, that people were talking about, especially, hold on, I'll just pull up my notes, um, were just uh, adequate lighting, space and visibility. Um, so route, making routes safer, uh, feel, feel and be safer. Um, uh, crime prevention through environmental design principles is another one as well. Um, yeah, so I've just got um, Rainbow Crossing Public Art by Rainbow Artists and other design elements. Um, and yeah, and a lot of these, these things can be used to um, even in the, the temporary cycle lines as well, which is really cool. Um, because it's not too hard to um, to to do some of those, um, and that makes a difference as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and oh, sorry, just a supplementary. Um, are there any queer public spaces anywhere in Aotearoa or New, um, overseas where you just go look at that to, you know, like as as a good example? So it was we love the Rainbow Crossing, and it was very contentious, but it's you know it was really important. So. What else can, apart from, I mean, we did the traffic lights with Carmen and the art, absolutely. Are there some other things? Yeah, um, if I recall from the uh, community, um, someone, uh, sorry, from the Hui, someone was talking about Berlin as well as a, as a as a good example. I don't know too much, I haven't been to Berlin, uh, but that was just something that um, people talked about. I think as well, uh, there are a few people who had been in uh, uh K Road as well. I know that the the cycle lane there has some issues, but um, there are many good things about K Road in terms of being uh, welcoming and inclusive. So I think those are some good things to keep in mind. Right, thank you. Right, some great contributions. More questions, comments that anyone wants to make. Terry. Actually, I did just have a quick one. Mark, were there any particular changes that yourself or groups you're a part of wanted us as councillors to focus on if there were, there were a few key things that you wanted to get across? Uh, it, was, it was probably just those, those things about the low traffic and the, and the tactical urbanism. I'm really looking forward to the, the new town uh, to city cycle route. Um, I think it's going to be, I mean, I've seen that route change dramatically over the seven years I've lived here, more women cycling on a regular basis, um, which is awesome. Uh, and, the, and the drivers have actually become a lot, a lot, um, a lot nicer towards people on bikes, which is great uh, because, there's, because there's quite a lot of us. Um, I think uh, some of the main arterials around Newtown are still really, really tight um, for cycling. So getting the route through through Baron Paul is going to be a bit of a challenge, um, but but yeah, I, I think people, are, especially in my because I I'm from uh, Baron Paul Community Association, so I'll probably talk on behalf of them a bit. Um, our, our sort of senior members are kind of just puzzled about how it's all going to happen. Um, kind of broadly supportive, but just kind of yeah, um, it's 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 imagining it. It's the difficult part, and I know that that comes with. Um, with trials and stuff and, and that kind of thing and no amount of artwork or maps especially maps I mean people I love maps but I mean some people just they can't find you know is, it, is that very important um yeah so uh but also you know um any kind of artworks or, or that kind of thing you, you, you have done a great job especially the um let's get Wally moving artworks and stuff um 
they were actually quite hard to interpret because they were quite radically different from what's there right now but um having somebody there to talk them through so that that engagement's been really good uh, i've um, uh, enjoyed seeing how that went um at, i think that was at salvation army uh uh in newtown and also the one in island bay i went to went on to so i think that's it focus on as many communication channels as possible um uh and uh yeah and and that's probably uh, uh yeah a good way to get started try and sell that that big picture uh on those communication channels and then uh, i know there's a lot of detail in the plans and streets are named individually but don't get into the weeds too early i suppose thank you mark Cheers. Thank you. All right. Any last comments? We're allowed to go till three twenty uh, three thirty. I think I would like to um, draw back to what Katie mentioned about like Jubilee's Key and the waterfront and those shared spaces. Um, I, I, I appreciate what Terry mentioned about like you know multimodal journeys together um, on those um, kind of shared spaces. Um, but I also think I think it's quite frustrating for both people walking and people on bikes trying to navigate those spaces when you're dodging each other and going different speeds or um, I think we've all been there. Um, so I think that it's also worth considering if we can um, have an alternative more um, dedicated lane for traveling along areas like that kind of Jewish key route as shown in the plan. Yeah. Bermuda kind of separated from recreation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've always been a bit worried about that. Would you feel safe? I know obviously it would be fully separated from very fast moving traffic, but you'd feel safe doing that? Uh, yeah, and I think it's I think it's often pre preferable for many people on bikes, just being able to zip through without worrying about dodging people because at least you're separated, right? Should we slow the traffic down too? I wouldn't say no. <laughs> okay. Whoa, okay. that would get pushed back. It's a pretty hostile road. That's just, I guess, yeah. yeah. It's a hideous mm. road to bike on, um, but I do it often. So uh, any improvements you can make would be great. But don't try and slow the traffic down. That would just frustrate the hell out of drivers. Okay. Yeah, that's an NZTA call. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which many councillors would love to. <laughs> right. Uh, so okay. just, just before I go, I'll just make a couple of comments. So I yes. would be wary of comparing us to Denmark because uh, it's a very flat country compared to Wellington especially, so I'm sure you've talked about that already. No, Aarhus is not flat at all, and if you've ever been to Weile, it's a grad school. They are running some stages of the Tour de France in Denmark this year, so it's, it's not a flat country, and it's very windy too. And even Hagen, so it's the only place I've had experience of. Um, talking about education of, of residents, I think pedestrian education would be really good. That, that, like they're the biggest hazard that I meet, especially commuting through the central city. People just stepping out onto the road while they're looking at their phones and things generally um, pose more of a risk than drivers, in my experience. Um, and finally, I'm going to end on a highlight. I love the green strips at the traffic lights. They're great. Right. Uh, Ian, did you have your hand up? Hand up? Yes, I just wanted uh, to mention um, the, a development we had in Brooklyn at Vogelmorn Park where we put a cycle track around the uh, playing fields there and that um, encouraged young people into cycling and, and got them uh, bike confident in a, a safe manner um, by able to cycle around a, a flat surface. And then as James mentioned, there are not many flat surfaces in Brooklyn. Um, but uh, that's something that uh, could be looked at to promote cycling in other areas as well as the development of a safe um, cycle uh, practice loop. Um, there's, there's one at Karori Park and um, the one at um, Vogelmorn Park in Brooklyn was modelled on that. So it's in the um, relevant to the uh, overall cycling plan, perhaps. Great, thank you. All right, any last comments? No. All right, well, we've had, got lots of notes, lots of ideas. So thank you so much for giving us your valuable expertise and it will be taken on board. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you. So we're just- yeah, thank um, you. 
great. We're just going to get all the councillors back. You're welcome to stay around. We're just going to move the recommendations and, and vote. But otherwise, um, thank you. And um, I'm sure we've got a busy day, so we don't want to hold you up as well. Um, right. Great. Okay. Well, um, uh, welcome back, everyone. And now my Heidi to um, introduce oh, to um, introduce the report. Thank you, Councillor Pennett. Um, hopefully, you've all enjoyed the sessions we've had today with all of the speakers to the Pāneke Pōneke Bike Network Plan Forum. Um, just to give you a little bit of information about how I've divided the rooms up, it's mostly random, but I also take into account whether the speakers are in favour or against the submission. So I just aim for a bit of a balance across the table so that you hear from both perspectives. I'm also aiming for a bit of a balance politically and geographically of yourselves as councillors so that people get to speak to a range of people. Um, yes, so other than that, I'll take the report as read. Councillors, has anyone got any questions? Right, well, I uh, have great pleasure in uh, introducing um, or um, moving the uh, recommendations. Uh, have I got a seconder? Deputy Mayor Free. Thank you. Um, and all I'd just like to say is um, a, a warm thanks to us, but as I did enjoy it, um, and I think we've got some useful insights. So I've just got to make sure that some of those are incorporated when the, um, the plan comes back. Deputy Mayor Free, do you wish to speak? Um, yes, I, <laughs> I, I just want to say that I was um, very surprised, but maybe it's a sign of the times are changing, that there was so much, uh, so many submitters in support. Um, we did have a fairly interesting conversation with foodstuffs um, in the last forum, um, but even that was quite uh, useful because, um, yeah, I think it's always good to hear both sides and for people to be able to contribute their thoughts, um, even when there's not complete agreement on, um, or there's a lot of nervousness, is probably a fairer way of putting it, a lot of nervousness and apprehension about what might be being proposed, but to actually have that kind of free conversation, uh, I think it is actually quite useful. And I'm very grateful too, I'd just like to put in a plug for um, the staff, the staff's assistance with this process, uh, especially um, some of our technical staff who are able to come in at, and um, provide really good answers to, um, to some of the questions raised by the public. So I think these forums are quite useful especially with these um, slightly controversial topics. And I think people do feel um, more relaxed and more able to really be honest about what they think. So I think it's very useful. And I think, you know, we can genuinely thank everyone involved. Uh, Councillor Wolf. Oh, yeah, hi, um, well, I, I absolutely echo what um, uh, Deputy Mayor Free said about the staff. These were very um, seamless um, forums. Um, I thought that our groups were, were very balanced and pragmatic, and 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 I I um, thought that you know there was a, a great deal of positivity coming through. Um, there were pros and cons, um, but it was actually um, useful. And and to the degree that I would have um, probably preferred everybody to be hearing everybody else's um, feedback, because there was was some feedback within our three all three groups that other groups could have benefited from. So I'm just, just putting it out there. Gilda, any other comments? Right, okay. Well, we can now, um, oh, sorry, Councillor Calvert. Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button. Look, um, I, I just really want to follow on from Deputy Mayor Free, and I did make this comment in the, um, when we were listening to um, submitters, and, and thank you to the submitters. Um, it's a big ask to um, present, um, even on Zoom. Um, but I, I do worry about who we haven't heard from. Um, it was, um, um, we're all out there in the community and I know we probably got certain different demographics. Um, I think we obviously need to hear from everyone with respect and not criticize their views. Um, um, I think that's important whether it's on these meetings or uh, on through other means, um, they're all entitled to their views. So, but I just think we are missing 
um, you know, we, and I'm not sure we, we actually heard right across, you know, representative of the demographics of Wellington. So I just counter um, Deputy Ms. Free's comments. Um, I, um, because I feel that we actually, um, we, today we haven't actually really heard from what I'm hearing out there in the streets, but I appreciate that I also talk, I'm probably liaising with people different to, um, um, to some of you. Okay, that's all. Okay, Councillor Day. Very quickly, um, I feel like I did hear diverse views today and um, it was really helpful to understand where the thinking comes for the diverse views. So I, I thought it was quite well rounded from what we heard. Um, and I just want to say um, to Councillor Wolf, if we did it that way and we listened to all of them, that would have tripled um, our, the time for our day today, which I think with all the other hearings coming up, we just have to find a way through that's um, that, you know, that is practical and we can go back and watch them if we feel it's important. So anyway, leave it there. Let's, let's move on and vote. <laughs> Free. Yeah, no, um, my point was just going to be the same one Jules just made, that it, it's online, it's recorded, and last time when we had the Evans Bay um, forums, I took the time to, to listen to all of the different chat rooms, so anyone who's really interested can do that, I, I do encourage you actually. <laughs> Kia ora. all right, and um, oh, sorry, Liz Kelly. Oh, I just wanted to say that I actually quite enjoyed it, even though I didn't... Um, I don't really understand the detail of all the streets. Like I know Wellington, but not the detail of, of the streets that they were talking about. But I found it really interesting to, um, to just get an oversight of what was happening and what people were thinking. Some of them were pretty much um, all in line with each other, but it was good when there was some variances and some bearable views. So yeah, I thought it was a good process. Sure. All right, um, and uh, Deputy Mayor Free, thank you for thanking the staff. They've done a great job, so I'm um, very grateful to them as well. All right, so if we can vote now, please. Thank you. Uh, so that's 12 votes in favour, carried unanimously. Kia ora, Heidi. Thank you for all your hard work, um, too. You did a lot of uh, work contacting the submitters, so thank you. So now, atena kua mutu te hui. Um, I declare the meeting closed. And if you'd like to say the karakia with me, but with <laughs> the volume off, um, that would be awesome to do that. Una hia, una hia, una hia, kuta uru tapu nui, kia watia, kia mama, te nako, te tinama, te wairua, e te ara takutu, hoia rā e rongo, whakaria aki ki runga, kia watia, kia watia, ai rā, kua watia. Kia ora everyone, thank you so much for all your hard work and I will see some of you in three minutes. Kaki te.